We have a quorum of advisory here now. Um, so I may at least just call the meeting to order. I might wait for a few more people to roll in before before getting into the meat of things. But can I get a uh, motion from an advisory member to uh, open the meeting? So moved. So moved. Second. second. Uh, great, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, let's see, I've moved you guys on to the top of my screen here. So we'll go in order. Um, Dan? Aye. Mark? Aye. Wasim? Let's get Wasim for now. Jane? Jane, was that an I? Yep, that was an I. Can, okay. You can't hear me? I, I didn't hear you, but I can hear you now. OK, that's good, because I've been having some trouble with my speaker. So. Uh, and then Wasim, are you actually there? If not, uh, Brendan, we're just voting to open the meeting. So, uh, Brendan, how do you vote? Great. Uh, all right. Well, we, we, that's at least five people to open the meeting. So uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order at uh, 7.02 p.m. This is the Sherborne Advisory Committee uh, meeting of Wednesday, February 9th. Um, and uh, first off, uh, could I get somebody to volunteer to take the minutes? Don't all don't all speak up at once. <laughs> Anyone? Dan, you want to do minutes? Oh wait, you you're uh, you're muted, Dan. My Zoom died. Sorry. So I missed the last forty seconds of whatever happened. Uh, I am asking if anyone wants to take minutes, and I. Now I'm asking you if you want to take sure, minutes. Sure, sure. Because nobody that. else has volunteered. <laughs> sure. Um, all right, let's see here. Uh, so, so far we've got uh, myself, Dan Stickle, Mark Albers, Wasim Basili, Jane Matarazzo, and Brendan Daly. Um, I do know that uh, Peter's not going to be here and uh, Nat's going to be a bit late. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, we're just waiting on um, Steve Leahy. Um, I think we are probably okay to um, get going on the meeting. Uh, so I'm going to start by reading the agenda. <clears throat> um, so first off, addition of topics not reasonably anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance. Does uh, anybody have any items they want to add to the agenda? All right, seeing none, uh, then we will have liaison reports. Um, then we will do the FY23 budgets for the fire department, police department, uh, select board legal um, to include um, IT and then uh, also sustainability. And then we'll do uh, previous meeting minutes. Uh, and that's it. Does anybody have any questions or comments about the agenda? All right, if not, then uh, I propose that we go on to the liaison reports. Does anybody have any any liaison reports? Uh, yeah, Dan. I've got a couple things. Um, one, I'll just mention that uh, capital budget met last night. So we heard capital requests from Chief Ward, Chief Galvin from Elderly Housing and from Sean Colleen for DPW. Um, nothing from schools yet. Um, I could talk about numbers, but it's probably not worth doing. It's all going to come through us before long. Uh, but, you know, it's a good, I thought a good productive meeting last night. Great. I was also going to mention uh, just take maybe two minutes, if it's okay, to just provide a little bit more background on this uh, ARPA strategy proposal that's floating around. So uh, Sam Nelson and I put that together, um, Marion Neutra, who I think is on the call, and uh, Jeff uh, Waldron um, have gotten interested in this. And so we've been talking and put together a um, PowerPoint, which I think will get presented at the select board meeting, I think not tomorrow, but probably two weeks from tomorrow, and thought, um, it's not something I'm doing in any official capacity as an advisory member. Uh, I'm just doing this as a resident of uh, Sherburn. Um, but given that it touches on things that we've been doing and there's been a lot of talk amongst us about the need for the select board, the desire for the select board to propose some kind of framework um, 
thought I would take like two minutes and just give you the quick shot of what it what it looks like. Does that sound okay, Steve? Yep. Um, I also just want to announce that Steve Leahy has joined the meeting. Um, it's because I'm, I'm supposed to uh, I'm supposed to announce every time an advisory member joins or leaves the meeting. Okay. Um, all right. So, did you want to share your screen, Dan? Sure. Let me do that. Just one second here to get that set up. Okay, can everybody see uh, slides? <clears throat> yep. I'm not gonna go through the whole presentation. Um, everybody here knows most of it, but I'll just highlight a few things. Uh, one slide here just to illustrate of the nearly 1.3 million uh, of ARPA funds available to the town. Uh, so far, the town has allocated about a quarter of it in this kind of piecemeal fashion that I think we've all found pretty frustrating with a bit less than a million uh, still unallocated. And quick list here of some of the things that the money has uh, gone to thus far. Um, The basic strategy we're proposing is to divide, uh, to think about dividing funds up into two buckets, one bucket for capital projects, one for, which would be more routine things, one bucket for signature projects that would leave a uh, longer lasting uh, legacy, variety of splits that could be contemplated in terms of how much in each bucket. Uh, capital projects, we've got a framework with capital budget committee and advisory committee in place to kind of evaluate those. And on the signature projects, the thought was not to form a new committee, but rather to have an informal coordinating group that would facilitate communication and outreach with somebody from the select board, somebody from advisory, somebody from capital budget, uh, interim finance director, town treasurer, and whoever else uh, you know the select board thought needed to be um, involved in that. Uh, my understanding is that Eric Johnson has hired a consultant to work on some of these topics, and the hope would be that that stream and this stream could all be combined and people could work together on that. And uh, last slide I'll share. This was kind of an idea. It's, it's a little, um, uh, it's a little, I guess you could say it's a little business school like, but kind of a flow chart of how this might work. Um, first stage of developing ideas, withdrawing from departments, boards, committees, um, community more broadly. Uh, then a stage of kind of integration and analysis of evaluating projects that have bubbled up, um, doing some coordination if there are projects that cut across different departments, um, and then getting into kind of analysis and kind of vetting of projects in both that integration analysis phase and then also with the typical kind of structure of advisory capital budget and others to uh, identify a set of projects to recommend to the select board and then ultimately select board would uh, have authority to make these decisions and perhaps on some of these projects the select board would decide that they wanted it to go uh, to the voters either in town meeting or in some other fashion. So the idea here was to have a pretty light structure but to have some structure, some framework, have the select board make some judgment about how much to capital projects, how much to signature projects, uh, with the idea of giving advisory and everybody else involved in this some overall guidance in uh, how this process might go. More slides, but I think that's enough to give a general flavor. Um, again, um, in, as this gets presented, uh, there are different views on the select board. I have no idea what they're ultimately going to decide to do. The, the point here is just try to move the conversation forward. Um, and hope that it helps them think about, you know, either this or some other framework or strategy. Uh, not looking for, you know, would love any comments or reactions, but not looking for anything formal from advisory. Uh, you know, this isn't an advisory project. This is just me, but given that it touches on work that advisory does, seemed like it was worth just kind of making sure everybody knew this was going on. So let me stop sharing and stop there happy to respond to questions or take any comments or do that offline or whatever. We can just move on to if it's time to get on to other stuff. Uh, no, thanks, Dan. It, uh, I think it's an, it's an important thing to be aware of. Um, again, it's, it's not officially an agenda item and it's not officially even 
an advisory thing that we are making this specific recommendation, but um, I do think that it is probably important for advisory members to be aware of um, what you're doing. Um, and I guess I, I would say probably right now, if anybody has any questions or comments um, for Dan, um, feel feel free to, 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 to chime in. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. Like, that's great um, to add some organization to and, and <clears throat> process uh, to the, these requests, I think is is absolutely necessary because otherwise we're it's either we're going to waste it or we're going to regret how we spent it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Brandon. I agree. Thank you very much, Dan, for doing this, for moving the conversation forward. All right. And uh, if I heard you correctly, Dan, the, the select board is most likely not going to be discussing this tomorrow, but probably at their meeting two weeks from tomorrow. Is that right? So my understanding is that it's not on the agenda for tomorrow. I think uh, Marianne's on the call, so she may want to jump in here. She may know more than I do, but that it uh, may come up in uh, select board member reports tomorrow, but that it's expected to be on the agenda on the 24th. <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, on mute. That's correct, Dan. Uh, it's not on the agenda tomorrow, partly because, uh, you know, uh, Dan and uh, Sam Nelson, uh, Jeff and I just worked on this. It's it's only days old. We figured that we it needs to be refined. We need to get a timeline in there and just uh, have all the ducks really in order uh, when we take it to select board. And the select board will need uh, to discuss it. So. Uh, it's there's not an agenda item that allows discussion this time. Can I just ask Marion what what changed? Because the last time we met, I thought it was scheduled to be on tomorrow night's agenda. Uh, no, it hadn't been scheduled yet. There was a suggestion that it should be on tomorrow night's agenda. And I think that <laughs> suggestion may have come from me, actually. But uh, <laughs> it we don't feel it's ready for tomorrow night. So rather than do a, you know, a halfway job, we want to just uh, make a, a guide the discussion such that uh, we get out, we, we get a clear answer out of it. So you and others will know which way to go. Great. Hopefully things actually do move along. Um, all right, any other liaison reports? Well, the school, I don't know, Steve, Brendan, do you, do you want to say anything about the schools or do you want me to do it or the Sherman schools? <laughs> okay, well, I'll, yeah. I'll, <laughs> um, the Sherman schools presented version two of their budget last night. Um, they went in the opposite direction of the region. They've actually added to their budget um, by about $66,000, $67,000. So they have a total increase in their budget from last year of 5.5%. Um, they did mention, there is some room. I mean, they did indicate a couple of places where they could make some reductions if necessary. Most of the increased um, portion of the budget is due to the positions, the new positions that we've talked about at some of our prior meetings. Um, but um, they did mention that right now they're only budgeting circuit breaker at 60%, but yet um, there's a new, some new legislation that I guess is going to um, make it certain that we will get at least the 75% that we're supposed to get. So Don did mention that if necessary, they could add another or, you know, add another, take another 50 to 60,000 of an assumption from circuit, circuit breaker, which would reduce the budget by that amount. Um, she also mentioned about $40,000 and other expenses that she thought they could take out if need be. So, you know, there is some wiggle room there, but budgets right now going in, in the opposite direction of the way we like to see it go. 
did they acknowledge at all the fact that they were what something like five hundred thousand uh, dollars under budget last year and like three hundred thousand the year before that and also the year before that? Um, well, they sort of did, but in a um, they view that as a positive. You know, they were saying, well, you know, for the last two years our budgets have gone up by very small percentages, and we gave a bunch of money back to the town last year. So basically, it's our turn. <laughs> I mean, they didn't say it that uh, way. <laughs> That was kind of the the implication. I don't know. To me, that's bad budgeting, right? I mean, if if you say that you need, uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars and you only use seventy five thousand dollars, and it's like, what? What? Why? Why did you ask for a hundred thousand dollars? Right? I don't. <clears throat> I mean, that that money was taxed, you know. Yeah. So. I mean, in fairness, we know that COVID. You know, they had a lot of unusual things happen as a result of COVID. So. They did, but that they're. Was, um, yeah. But but I believe uh, I believe their trend of being um, way under their um, budget uh, goes back to before COVID. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be an that'll be it's going to be an interesting meeting next week. Um, all right. Any other liaison reports? All right. If not, uh, we will move on to the budgets. Um, first up, we've got the fire department. Chief Zach Ward is here. Um, did you wanna do your um, operating first and then capital second? All right. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, all right, I can, and I've got, I've got budgets for fire and EMT here. Um, yep. do, you, do you wanna do, which one do you wanna do first? I'll do fire first. I'm actually getting some feedback from somebody's speaker and i'm having trouble hearing you steve uh, it might be mine i think it might be lazy it's not mine okay i can uh i can just go ahead if you'd like uh steve can you try muting yourself where wherever you are is there background noise great all right hang on let me uh let me get your budget on screen here. All right. All right. Well, thanks for having me back uh, yet again. I feel like we were just doing this a couple months ago. So mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with two significant changes to the wage section of the, the salary section of the budget, okay? So the first one's gonna be the FD administrator. As you can see, there's a reduction of 48% uh, in that line. And that's because we're taking that job. That job was a 40 hour job and we cut that down to 19 and a half hours. So what happened is we had a 40 hour full-time administrator and she left um, in the early spring or the, maybe the mid spring excuse me, fall of last year. And um, at the time, the full-time lieutenant and I uh, looked at all the job functions that we do on a day-to-day -day basis at the fire department. We looked at what some of our skill sets are and the different uh, functions that we carry out on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, with the administrator leaving, it gave us, you know, that really good opportunity to evaluate that. So we decided that going forward, we did not need a full 40 hour per week position. So we cut that to 19 and a half hours. So we have somebody working three, six and a half hour, hour days in that job right now. And it's worked out quite nicely. Uh, we're actually able to hire one of our firefighters to fill that role. So there's, there's dual benefit there too, because it puts another firefighter in the building for um, about, about 20 hours a week. So um, that's been really good, and it's it's definitely worked since we filled that, and I believe it was November. So we got a good trial period to do that before um, we were too deep into this budget process to to sort of turn turn back. Um, and then looking at the overall operation, um, I added something um, that I think has been really long overdue for the town, and that's that call firefighter stipends line. So right now, Sherburn firefighters uh, cover approximately 17,000 hours 
per year of on call time. And what they do is uh, we have six groups of uh, five or six members and they rotate on a six night basis. And they basically cover the town from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. every single night, 365 days a year. And they're currently not compensated for that. Um, so looking long-term to maintaining a robust, what I consider a robust and successful call department, um, based on what I reviewed in other towns and what I think uh, might help us long-term, I added this line in. Um, and I think it, it, it sort of worked out with the reduction from the administrator there. Um, what this would mean for Sherburn's call firefighters, um, they, if they participate in that six night group system and they're a trained firefighter or trained apparatus driver, it means they'd make approximately um, $1,100 per year. As you can see, that number is 22.8. We have 26 firefighters, not including the officers that participate in this. We'd pay the stipend out on a monthly basis. So by doing that, there are some months where they wouldn't hit all their nights and they wouldn't um, earn that stipend. That's why that number is a little lower because I, based on what we've been doing, I calculated what I expect would happen going forward. So that's a little less than the 25 people. Um, I looked at stipends in other towns and I found a range from approximately $1,500 to as high as $5,800. And that $5,800 was one of our neighbors. And that town that pays $5,800 also provides their call firefighters with health insurance. Um, so I think that's a pretty reasonable um, number for what is being provided. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions on the salaries area of the budget. Sorry, hey Chief. Sorry, I, I missed one part of that. So, the total number. So basically, what's the stipend per person? I, I noted you said what the numbers are for the adjacent town, but what's our number per person? So it's it's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna average to be about eleven hundred dollars per firefighter, maybe a little less. It's gonna depend on how many months they hit that criteria, Steve, as far as covering their five on call nights for that month. So it's gonna it's gonna end up to be about twenty bucks a night for their coverage. And again. We don't, another thing I wanna bring up is we have no um, incentive for our members to become certified firefighters or drivers right now. There's no wage, hourly wage difference. There's no incentive for that. I think this is a, um, a simple way to do that, to kind of kill two birds with one stone, to give them a little compensation for covering all those nights. And they put a lot of effort into covering those nights. I mean, if they're not there, they get coverage, they do swaps. Um, you know, they, you know, we always have five or six people ready to go um, at a moment's notice. They're coming from home, obviously. So there's a, you know, they're not, it's not an immediate response, but at least we're guaranteeing a response. Yep. Thank you. All the time. <clears throat> um. Were there any other questions on the salaries? Jane, I think you're muted. Just curious, for the other um, towns that are providing stipends, are those also situations where the on-call folks are at home or are they in the state, you know, are they? Yeah, great question. They're all on, they're all at home and the other situations where they're being provided stipends, it's usually not tied to any on-call time. It's usually just for having your name on the list and being a member. But the small, the cheapest town that I found for the stipends that was tied to on-call time was $2,850 per year. Um, so that, like I said, that 1500 to 5800 number, most of those are just, just for being a member of the active member of the fire department. Thank you. No, thank you. Because <clears throat> um, I should have mentioned that. So, so um, um, so so essentially, you're paying for the stipends by reducing the um, administrator to part time. 
Uh, do you anticipate that moving forward, you will be able to cover all of the administrative duties with just that part-time? Or is this yeah. kind of like, you, you think that it might just be a temporary thing? So I, the way that I see it now, Steve, is for the next two to three years, we're going to be fine at 19 and a half hours, unless something drastic changes, which I don't see that happening. Um, like I said, we, we hired this gentleman that we have in that job in early November, and it's worked out um uh quite nicely and and i so i don't i don't see any uh need to go back up above 19 and a half which would also trigger benefits again because we dropped the benefits on that position this year by going right. to 19 and a half so um i do i think for the foreseeable future i think we'll be um all right at 19 and a half <laughs> great any other questions or comments about the salaries? All right, do you wanna move on to your expenses then? Yeah, and I, so I'm gonna summarize a couple different things that, a couple different things that are going on with the expenses. So you can see a new line, equipment maintenance. You can see our hose line, which has been zeroed out at uh, from 1600 last year. And then if you go further down, there's a line, it's 5,800. You can see FD, SCBA, and equipment. That's actually um, just FD equipment. The, the, the name's coming up wrong on this. I may, I may have entered it incorrectly or taken a different line incorrectly. So what's happening now is when we have equipment that has to be repaired, we're paying for it out of our new equipment account. Um, and we spend on average like $3,000 per year, per year on repairing equipment. When I say equipment, I'm not talking about vehicles. I'm talking about chainsaws, air packs, uh, nozzles, um, gas meters, all the other little different things that we carry. Um, and with everything that's been going on with inflation and all those things, that, that account, that equipment account, 5,800, really can't sustain that anymore. And I also think that going forward, we should be tracking those expenses in a different account, uh, those maintenance expenses. <clears throat> so that's why we added that $2,000 for, for equipment maintenance. Um, and, and I took that 1600 from that hose line. I took a thousand of that and put it into the equipment maintenance. So I don't believe we should have a hose line. I'll tell you why. Out of all the different things that we have, um, we don't, usually when we buy new equipment, it's because something broke or something failed in inspection. So we don't know necessarily that we're gonna buy $1,600 worth of hose over here. $1,600 actually does not buy a lot of hose. Um, we have like 19,000 feet of hose. I think 1,600 bucks will get us like two or 300 feet. So um, that's why I decided to kind of shuffle some things around. I think it'll better reflect what we do and what we need going forward. Um, so I can take any questions on, if you want on those moves, and then I have a couple more um, changes. Anybody have any questions about the equipment increases? All right, keep on going, Zach. Okay, and then I have a we have a few a couple increases. So the first increase is under training, which is fifty three oh eight. Uh, this in, in the next two lines I'm going to talk about, we actually came forward with re increases last year. As you may recall, last year, we, the, we had the grant expiring from the full-time lieutenant, so we decided to put some of these things off a year. And basically, these three lines, um, which would be the training, the clothing allowance, and the protective clothing, really aren't enough um, for us to adequately sustain a, basically a 50-person operation. Um, so we have some expenses like these that are a little higher than some other smaller departments. Those smaller departments, though, um, when I say smaller, that means less people. That means basically they have full-time people. Obviously, our model um, saves a substantial amount of money on wages because we're not paying a, um, a heck of a lot of full-time people. But some of our expenses are going to be a little higher because of that. And those three are all... the. Uh, examples of that. The training one in particular, so we respond to a variety of emergencies, as you know. Um, 
And we don't have all like the subject matter experts in house to train people on these, some of the different things we do like hazmat or technical rescue or some of the different things that we respond to. So that's what that accounts for primarily. And most of these instructors, when they come in, they charge a fee per student and it might be like 150 bucks a head. So with the operation with as many people as ours, you know, $5,000 isn't enough to sustain this. Before I met with Wasim, who was one of my uh, liaisons, that number was at 10,000. Um, but Wasim uh, advised me of some of the challenges going on with the budget this year. So I cut that back down to seven. Um, and that's the same story basically with the clothing allowance and the protective clothing. We simply don't because of both the number of people we have, some of it's inflation too with the clothing allowance and the protective clothing. We just really don't have uh, enough funds to sustain our operation here. Um, I think you can see that with the actuals for protective clothing. Clothing allowance is almost there as well. Um, and honestly, training is there also. So I think some of these are a little overdue um, coming into this, this fiscal year. Uh, and then I just have one more office supplies. We reduced that a little bit um, by $350. And I added another line for station supplies. So what was happening is things that we were buying for the station um, that weren't really office related, things you know that we just have to purchase from time to time. We were, we were charging to that office supply line. And I, again, I didn't think that was an accurate reflection of the operation. Um, so we, we cut that out and added another line. There was a net increase there it's of uh, $450, I think. But those, so those are some of the expense changes. Uh, can you tell me more about that, the protective clothing line? Um, you know, one of my concerns is seeing the fact that um, you're still budgeting significantly below your three-year average. And then just looking at uh, this year, year to date, you're already over your budget for the entire year. So yeah, I guess what's, what's gone into that this year and what's, what, how's that 17,500 actually going to shake out? So that's a great question, Steve. So the reason why some of the actuals were high is when I came in, we had a lot of people in gear that was basically expired. So we have to retire gear after 10 years. And we had some gear that was less than 10 years old that was in terrible condition. So part of our certification every year is we get gear inspected. And I actually held off on getting the gear inspected because I was afraid they were going to take a lot of it out of service. So uh, we basically got caught up with uh, both the time, the 10 year timeline and the condition of some of the gear um, in that time frame. That's the fact that we've spent 15,000 this year doesn't surprise me because every year going into the fiscal year, I know who's gonna get replacement sets already. So that spend happens in the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, the only thing that worries me with, with that line now is say if somebody has a helmet that needs to be replaced or they get a, they spring a leak in their boots or something, you know, we're going to go over a little bit on that line um, more than we already have. But um, that's a, that's a line that gets spent up front usually. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it all generally makes sense to me. Um, I know, I think it was last year you had mentioned the fact that um, that that equipment maintenance was going to have to go up in your department. Um, so it's not it's not it's not a surprise. Um, um, I mean, I think you've done a good job. I would, I would prefer to see the expenses coming uh, not, or I, I, would, I should say, not going up as much as they are. But your 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 overall department uh, um, budget is is still coming in under our guidance. Um, but it is, it's it's a year when collectively the town uh, the town's budget requests are something like two million dollars over um, last year, um, which is just it's a huge amount of money. And so, especially with you know, larger departments like yours, I think we're going to be looking a bit closer to see, um, see if there's areas that that we can cut back. But 
I don't know. Does anybody from anyone else from advisory have any any comments? If if you look at all of your lines here, I mean, I, you've done a good job explaining them all. Um, are there any that you feel like you've given yourself a bit of wiggle room that you might be able to cut back a little on the wiggle room or is this pretty is this pretty tight? I think it's pretty lean. I'll tell you why. If you look at the three year averages, um, for the most part, they line up to our request. Um, and if the three year average doesn't, it might be because it's a newer line and it wasn't in FY19 or not all of it was spent in FY19. Um, you know, we, we did, you know, for instance, like NFPA certification, I cut that back a thousand, that's going to have to go up a thousand next year. I, I cut it back a thousand this year because I knew that in FY23, we didn't have to test any of our air bottles. So that's one of those things where I didn't just leave the thousand bucks in there. You know, I just, I knew uh, yeah. we we're going to have that particular expense. Um, you know, I do think that um, for our organization to operate, um, going forward that this is what we need. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions or comments from advisory for Chief Ward? At least on the fire, we'll move on to EMT next. Uh, all right, let me bring up your EMT budget. All right, tell, tell us about your EMT plan. So we have good uh, news right off the get-go with this increase uh, because that increase is coming down to 11,000. Uh, right now, I, I can't see because the people are on the screen. Um, yeah, can you zoom out a little, Steve? <clears throat> zoom, zoom out a little? Wait. Sorry, what's, what's the issue? So now I can see it. So we were budgeted okay. for $190,000 supplement. And this year I put in for a $205,000 supplement. That, that, based on my calculation, can actually come down to 201 from 205. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. So um, I actually wasn't going to add anything this year, but two things happened. Instead of a 2% COLA, um, obviously a 4%. COLA was approved and um, that's a significant hit on the, the ambulance revolving fund. The other um, thing I added was um, some weekend differential for the ambulance for the summer months um, for a couple of reasons. Um, and historically, we've, we've struggled more to fill the ambulance ships in the summer months. And right now, um, Fox 25 had a special on it the other night, ambulance staffing and the whole Commonwealth is a real issue. And to be completely honest with you, uh, we're starting to see some challenges with staffing our ambulance just this month. Um, you know, we have four, I think somebody just picked one up. So three open shifts between now and Saturday night. Uh, and, you know, we might fill some of them. We might have an on-call person. We might, we might be able to just figure it out, but looking forward to the summer, I, I 4,000 of that that increases for some summer summer differential pay. So giving the EMTs a few extra dollars an hour to work the ambulance on a summer weekend, basically from Memorial Day through Labor Day. And that's that's what that increases from the COLA and that summer different that summer weekend differential. And, and um, you know, we I know we've talked a lot about the ambulance and shortfalls and all that. And you know the from what I see, think now, I think the ambulance is going to be fine going into town meeting at the end of the year. I think we might even have a, a small surplus, but I think it's key to keep that because, you know, next year, you know, the rev, the same revenue might not be there. Um, it's not a guaranteed revenue source, like the, something like the farm pond stickers, because it depends on how many calls we get, depends on how many transports we do, and it depends on the insurance that those people that we, what, what they have for insurance. Um, 
So it's kind of complicated. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, I'm actually thinking about for next year um, to take this out of a revolving, to talk with advisory after this budget season, after town meeting, and to take this out of a revolving fund and put it back to a line item budget. Um, so it can, um, so we're not making up for it at the end of the year and hoping that the revenue comes in in June and then starting the next year low, if it doesn't, you know, it's, it's kind of a complicated process right now. Um, but that's, that's my story for the ambulance budget for this year. Okay. So. Um, I already changed that number, which is great. So. <laughs> yeah. And the reason why I know... that came down, by the way, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. So we, we had a $4,000 expense for quality assurance. And what that was is every single one of our calls that we do, the, the EMTs on the ambulance write a report, a pretty detailed report of what happened. And um, it's all required by both state law and federal law, all the information on that report. So somebody reviews each and every single report that we do. And we were paying a company out, outside to do that. Now I'm using somebody internally and they're doing it while they work in ambulance shifts. Basically, one of the, the Wednesday day shifts, uh, one of the EMTs working that is doing that work. So there's no real added expense to do that anymore. And he does a much better job too, by the way. So um, <clears throat> that's why there's a decrease. So. Um, I know there's been talk in the past about um, uh, increasing the whatever um, the EMT level in town. Yeah. Um, is that still something that you're strategizing right now? So we've had some internal discussions about that. And um, I'll give you the two minute summary of that. So right now uh, we're paying out for around $40,000 a year for paramedic intercepts. Sometimes these intercept take, intercepts take 15 or more minutes to get to the call in Sherburne. And we have nine, uh, eight or nine paramedics working for us right now. So yes, I have looked into num on a numbers front, seeing if ALS would make sense for Sherburne. And I honestly, from a financial standpoint, I think it would. Um, I think we could have a huge increase to our service for not a lot of cost. And when I say not a lot of cost, I mean, maybe $10,000 a year up front, maybe 20,000, because we're gonna be making more revenue by having medics, we're not going to be paying for intercepts, and this is this. I could go on and on about that. Um, the issue that I have with it, though, is we're having trouble a little bit of trouble staffing the ambulance at the BLS level right now. And again, mm -hmm. like I said, it's a statewide problem. We're doing better than a lot of other towns are, honestly. But um, I don't think with the shortage of EMTs and medics in the state, um, because our nine we need a few more than the nine that we already have. Um, I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable making that jump. Okay. So, uh, you know, because if we do that, we got to do it. We got to do it right. We got to do it well. It's regulated by the Department of Public Health, uh, Office of Emergency Medical Services. Um, but you know, we're lucky. You know, we actually have the forty thousand dollar cardiac monitor that we need to buy. That's the biggest purchase for any community. We already have it. Um, it, it'd be approximately ten thousand dollar cost in supplies up front. And then we'd have to pay the medics a little more hourly, obviously. We don't have one paramedic on the ambulance. And I just started days. Um, you know, that cost, I think, for the year is under 40000 We're paying that money out to get intercepts right now. But I, I don't really want to jump into that unless I think both the department's ready for it and we can sustain it with the staffing level in the state. Yeah. Um, so so this, this number that we're looking at, this 201, this is a supplement to the revolving fund. Is that right? Yeah. So that's a addition to the revenue that comes in. So basically, yeah. by rule of thumb, 50% of our cost for an ambulance service in town is paid for by revenue. And this covers the other 50%. Okay. That was my question was what, what's the um, ambulance revolving fund limit at? And if so if it's about 50%, then that, that answers it. Yeah. Um, and again, like I said, the revenue, it's very year to year dependent, you know, yeah. um, and we don't have a lot, like I said, we don't have a lot of control over it, honestly. Um, if, yeah. if, if I were to try to make more revenue for this account, I'd probably go to jail 
because I, you know, we'd be like cars causing car crashes and things like that, you know? So yeah, <laughs> suck that there's really no other options. So. All right. Anybody from advisory have any questions about the uh, ambulance uh, EMT budget? All right. If not, uh, do you um, you want to move on to capital? Yeah, and I have a short um, slideshow, if it, uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. If you don't mind. Go ahead. You should be able to share your own. No, wait. Go ahead. Jane. Sorry. Can I just ask a quick question on the? It's actually not for Zach per se on the budget. It's just kind of a general question. I noticed that. Um, 5,500, it looks like is coming out of the budget and getting transferred to the IT department. But where is that? Where, where are we seeing the IT department charges? Uh, uh, that's one of the budgets you'll go over after under the selectmen. It's a brand yeah. new department. It's gonna be department 155. Yeah, we'll so, cover that later in the meeting. Yes. Okay. Not under the select board anymore. Or Correct. it is separately. Okay. okay. Thank you, Diane. All right, Zach, um, if you want to share your PowerPoint, go ahead. Well, all right. Here we go. Okay, so the fire department ha has two uh, capital requests for this year. We're going to go through them both here. So the first one is for some self-contained breathing apparatus. As you may recall, we were uh, fortunate enough to receive a grant in the amount of $147,000 two summers ago. And that replaced 21 out of 29 of our SCBA units. And uh, right, so we're coming back to the town to request the funding to replace the other eight um, for a couple of reasons. Basically, we're, we're using two different types of air packs right now. Um, not really the best idea, especially in a model like ours where people are riding on different trucks every day, not like the cities where they're assigned to a truck and they ride in the same one every day. Um, so, in the, so the air packs have two, two different types of features and, and different safety components and all that. Not only that, the ones that we're replacing are pretty, pretty old and we're spending um, a significant amount of money on that. That equipment line that I put in the operating budget is only at $2,000 because I plan on because we plan on replacing these if it goes through town meeting. Um, if we kept, if we kept these and, and kept uh, repairing them, you know, I'd probably have to double that equipment maintenance line, or maybe even add a little more. Every time an air pack goes out, it's at least five hundred bucks these days. So um, <clears throat> we're looking to just basically make these units uniform throughout the department. The new units have um, certain safety features, and you can actually see that's a photo of. Uh, one of the new units that we got the grant on, uh, being worn by one of our members at a, at a fire out of town last year. Um, so they're gonna have the same safety features as, as the new units that we already have are. Um, and they include things like heads up display for air consumption. So the firefighters can actually see how much air they're using. Um, it, it includes a detachable regulator, which is one of the common pieces of this unit that gets broken. So instead of sending the whole unit out and taking it out of service, we can detach the regulator if that's the part that's broken, that, that'll save uh, us on some amount of service time. A big thing for us, which is in a new NFPA standard, is the low air alarm on this unit will go up at 33% instead of 25%. So what that means is as the firefighters breathe air, um, instead of getting that, basically that alert to get out of the building at 25%, they're gonna get out at 33% now, which basically gives them more time to get out of harm's way. And it has a better connection for the RIP pack, the rapid intervention team pack, uh, which would be used if, if a firefighter were to uh, uh, become injured or go down at a, at a fire and need to be rescued. So um, again, you know, we, we were really lucky to get that grant uh, when we did. Um, we had the opportunity to put in for that same grant to get these again, but it, I didn't think we were gonna get them um, because we just got the, the other 21 and the way that they look at that on the federal level, isn't that great? So instead of putting in for that grant for the, these eight units, we actually put in for the Jaws of Life, which was on our capital plan this year. And we, we, were, we were awarded the 60000 for the Jaws of Life. Those have been in service for about a month now. So that's why we didn't uh, go after a grant for these again. Um, 
<clears throat> so that's the SCBA. I'm just going to move right on to the next item, if you don't mind, Steve, and then we can we can talk just so I can close the, the PowerPoint. So the next item is for a UTV or a utility terrain vehicle. So this is a photo of the one that the fire department currently has. This unit was donated in 2011 by the Sherburn Fire and Rescue Association uh, to the fire department. It served the town very well, but this unit's had some significant uh, mechanical issues over the last 12 to 18 months that, that it's rendered the unit out of service periodically. Um, there's been a couple of times, luckily not for calls, but when this thing was due to report to a detail in town that it wouldn't start and for drills and when we do our regular checks that it wouldn't start. I went to the dealer. Um, we actually went to pick it up at the dealer. When we went to pick it up, excuse me, at the dealer, we went to start it when we were leaving the dealership and it wouldn't start. <laughs> so um, they recommended replacement and they're unbiased in that recommendation because they knew that uh, they wouldn't be getting um, the new one because it goes through government um, purchasing. So this is also a little limited in its capabilities. This is basically like a unit. If you had a large yard or a large property in town, you'd buy to, to, to put around in your yard with or maybe transport different items in, on your property. Um, and it, this unit wasn't designed for public safety use uh, to begin with. So that's the unit that we have. Um, this is the unit that we're looking to purchase. Um, be a little more durable, or I should say a lot more durable, and it is, these are specifically designed for public safety use. Uh, and I think that this new unit would be uh, pretty important to protecting Sherburn's natural resources uh, going forward, because right now on the unit that we have, we only have a rescue capability. So what we use the unit that we have now for primarily is to go into the Rocky Narrows, which is where we usually go, and to pick up like an injured hiker or maybe a hiker that has chest pain or somebody that's missing or lost. Um, so we only have that rescue capability now. What, we're, what we'd be looking to do if we were able to purchase this unit is to add some firefighting capability. Um, right now we have no firefighter capability on the unit we have. This would add a, like a 70 gallon water tank, a fire pump and fire hose. So if we had a fire like deep into the Rocky Narrows or another the Barber Reservation or any other uh, uh, conservation land in town, we could we could rapidly get in there and, and stop it. Um, that's the goal. As you can see, that's a photo of that unit, that um, skid unit with the firefighting capability on the left and the and the rescue capability on the right. So just to talk about uh, numbers a little bit, um, the cost of this vehicle is going to be right around thirty two thousand, and that includes important features like an enclosed cab. That wasn't in the photos, uh, but we're going to upgrade to a an enclosed cab for two reasons. We use we could use this in inclement weather a lot, um, so that'll protect the members in it from the, the elements. The other bigger concern for me is if this thing were to roll over um, while it was in the woods or whatever. I've actually been in a side-by-side -side that rolled over once, and, and the person I was with put their arm right out the window. <laughs> and that's not really the best thing to do when, when one of these things are going over. So... Uh, you know, that's why we really want an enclosed cab. So we don't have those issues. Uh, this unit would include a winch. So if it got stuck, it, it could kind of get itself out. Um, it would include emergency lights and sirens. Um, and it would include ample storage for first aid supplies and other PPE. Um, so to, you know, back on the funding for this, as you may recall, um, we had a command vehicle that we sold last year. And we were not able to take that those funds and put it directly towards a new vehicle because the money that we received from selling that vehicle had to go into the equipment revolving fund. And um, it was town council's opinion at the time that it had to go back in that fund and then be used to purchase something else. So to offset, the, you know, the goal was to offset a future cost that we had. And we, the town received approximately $33,500 for that, that command vehicle. So I've had some conversations with, with different people. And, um, you know, this is a need that we have. And, and that, that funding might work out quite nicely um, to, to use that. You know, again, that's, that's up for discussion. It's just an idea. Um, then the second piece of the funding, um, that skid unit in the back right there is not included in that $32,000. The, that'll cost approximately another $9,000. And we actually have a commitment from the Sherburn Fire and Rescue Association to purchase that skid unit if the town were to purchase the vehicle. 
Um, so that's approximately 25% of the cost. Um, and that's that's just really what I had for the, for the funding on that. Now I can stop sharing and we can talk about it. Great, thanks, Zach. Um, so uh, I guess my questions for your first uh, item, the um, SCBA. So uh, why, when the 21 units were replaced with the grant, like why didn't you just replace all of them? Was it just that the grant wouldn't cover that much? I put in for all 29 of them, but the eight that we're replacing now are a year newer than all the other ones. And the, the feds wouldn't, wouldn't replace them. So they only allowed us to replace the 21. And then if we went to, say if we went next year or the year after to apply to replace these eight again, because we got another one, even though it didn't, you know, even though it didn't cover these, it's kind of a red flag for them to say, hey, this fire department just got SCBA within the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, that might, you know, mess up the process and it would probably ruin our chances of getting something else potentially expensive. So, yeah. All right. Steve, you have a question? Yeah. So, uh, thank you. So, they're about 8,000 bucks a clip. And what is the average um, lifespan of each one of these? The SCBA, Steve? Yes, please. They're about 15 years. So, okay. basically, the NFPA standards updated every five years. Um, they don't want you going past three updates of NFPA because there's new safety features that come out. Part of it's that and then the wear and tear. It's, it's kind of both those things, but they're usually good for 15 years. Okay. And so then I'm sure there's some, as you, you were just pointing out, there's some updates, some maintenance on each of those units over the course of those 15 years, right? Yeah. In gen and so in general, over 15 years, if you've got a SCBA tank or, or rig, um, so, so if it costs eight grand to buy, what's the cost overall? Is it to maintain maintenance? them as well? Yeah. So over so, the 15 year life. Just for curious. a single unit, um, I can tell you what we spend collectively on all of them every year. Mm -hmm. So we have to test it, you, that NFPA certification line that we have. The air packs get flow tested every single year. Yep. Every mask that we have gets flow tested every single year. Every bottle, um, each pack has two bottles, one in the pack and then a spare, gets tested every five years. On average, we spend... I actually have it right here. Hold on a second. Three thousand dollars on the testing for these the units every year, and that's overall for the approximate thirty units that you have the twenty nine units. Yes. Okay. On the maintenance, it all it all depends on what it depends on honestly which trucks they're on because certain trucks they get used more than other, the other ones. Um, but like we had a fire Christmas Eve where we actually ran out of these units um, at the actual fire scene. So sometimes we use them all, sometimes we don't. Um, it, it is an NFPA requirement to have them have one in every riding position on all of our trucks. Um, but uh, over the course of each unit, it, it all depends on what breaks. It could be a $500 repair from, from time to time, or it, you know, it could be even a little more expensive than that. Okay, thank you for that. And then just last question, just a, another comment. I remember, with the previous chief um, a couple of years ago, we bought essentially some racks or some um, a, a tool to, I guess, um, re refill these tanks. Yep. Everything everything we've got and would be purchasing still fits in with that platform that we purchased a couple of years ago. It does, and that unit's worked out quite nicely. So okay. yeah, everything is compatible. Yeah. All right, any other questions um, about the SCBA units? <clears throat> um, all right, then moving on to the, um, the UTV. Um, so you're, so in your revolving, uh, the surplus equipment fund right now, you said you have about $33,000 and you're gonna use 32 of that for this vehicle? That would be the plan. Thirty okay. three thousand from the sale of that uh, other vehicle, right? Which is already in. That's already in the revolving fund, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so, so you're bringing this to us, but actually, it won't be a capital request at town meeting. Is that right? 
I don't think so. So, I mean, we could go a number of different ways because um, to spend the money out of that account, it's a select board vote. I still think that with it being a significant purchase, I think it went to capital budget last night. It's here tonight in front of advisory. I think it's worthwhile um, to kind of vet it out. Um, I don't know in the end though, if, if the goal would just be to ask the select board to expend that those funds or to, to do something else. I haven't got that far yet, so. Okay. Does anyone from advisory have any, I guess, thoughts or comments about that and or any questions at all about the UTV? Quick question on the UTV. Are you able to put like a person on a stretcher on that thing or is it just yeah. to get, okay. Yeah, so you, if you, you look at that unit, I can actually pull it up quickly. Um, I think it's, it's better. See that that photo right there, Brendan? So that device on the right, that's actually a stretcher that folds up. So in a normal situation, that would extend out and, and we could put a put a person on that. Um, and, and that's what we do now. And, and uh, it's, it, it, it's worked out quite nicely. We use this on average from like three to six times per year. Uh, and like I said, usually uh, we only used it twice last year, but other years, you know, it's usually more. It's usually to go into the Rocky Narrows. Um, and it's gone to some other places. It went off of South Street once, I think, for a cardiac arrest. I believe that ended up being over the line in Natick, but it's gone to uh, a, a significant number of medicals in the woods over its life. Okay, thank you. Kids. Um, can you can, can right. you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, quick question: What's this? What does skid mean? I think that's the one that has a nine thousand. That's that unit that I just showed uh, Brendan the photo of that has, so it's like an insert into the back, like you could picture like a pickup truck, like it's a unit that goes into the bed of that um, UTV that has that rescue and the firefighting capability on it. So it's detachable from the vehicle itself and it's an add-on. Thanks. That's what that skid unit is. Thanks. All right, any other questions or comments? All right. Um, if not, uh, I think we're I think we're done with with all of your with all your items. Okay, great. Thank you all uh, very much once again. I'm going to be sticking around though for the next one. So. All right. Yeah. Um, all right, I am actually, uh, Chief Galvin, I really apologize. I'm having a bit of a um, domestic crisis right now. So I'm, I'm gonna hand off to my vice chair, Mark Albers, to, uh, to run, run this meeting for, for a little bit. Hey, Steve, um, can, you, can you just pull up the budget first and display it? Yeah, actually, absolutely. If, if it's okay, I actually have a, actually a short series of slides and uh, that'll cover it all so that- Great. Uh, uh, so that would hopefully, if I can share my screen to. Uh, yeah, you should be able to share screen. Okay. So just to start, so as as I kind of said in the uh, in the beginning when we were talking informally, my my plan coming into this budget year was really it was learning um, that I, I didn't expect any drastic change as you know starting in November there wasn't much time in. in budget preparation to really learn, you know, how this budget's come, come to it to be what it is. Um, but as you know, and um, a, a, I think Steve probably distributed the updated budget kind of a few weeks ago um, after meeting with Mark and some changes, um, well, we kind of blew things up a little bit. Uh, but it, it's really, I think in the long run, it's, it's gonna be in the best interest of the community and, uh, and really in the best interest of the service that we deliver uh, public safety wise. So, I'll start out with personnel costs. And um, I'm going to go through a few things. There's a couple um, regular salaries and overtime that I'll touch on the, at the end of this because that's where the big changes really come. 
Um, but you see some high percentage changes in a lot of things, EMT stipend, um, longevity, um, holiday pay incentive. Um, although there may be higher percentages, especially in those two, the, the um, longevity and the EMT stipend, they're really low dollar changes and they just reflect contractual obligations. Um, we have an additional trained EMT now, and then we just have some changes in people's longevity levels and the, uh, the contractual uh, obligations that we have to them. Um, one thing that I will note on the contract is that it does expire at the end of June. We've started negotiations. So these numbers are a conservative estimate um, based on the recommended goal for this year. And uh, you know, we will see where the, uh, the actual negotiations go. But, uh, but turning to regular salaries and overtime, um, really what I wanna highlight with these changes is, is really um, two things I wanted to address um, is liability and retention. Um, but what it really does address is the future of this overtime number that, uh, that in the discussions I've had with everybody is, is a problem and has been a problem. Um, so if you look initially on regular salaries, um, there's actually a reduction from last year. Um, but even with that reduction, there are a couple of, couple of additions to the line. Um, there's a 19 and a half hour a week administrative uh, assistant position. Um, the department currently does not have uh, an administrative assistant. Um, we're going to, um, and I'll explain that more when we talk about expenses, moving towards and moving through the state accreditation process. And um, as things stand right now, our, our sergeants um, are, are doing a lot of administrative duties that, that remove them from the street and take them away from their, their hands-on supervisory duties. Um, so it, it not only addresses that liability of not having our supervisors on the street, um, but it's going to assist us as we move through the accreditation process, um, which is really going to put us in a better position overall as a department and, and hopefully reduce our overall liability. Um, but then ultimately we remove three, the three communication specialist positions out of regular salaries. And I'm going to dive deeper into that um, and in the next slide. Um, so what, as you know, and I just mentioned it, historically we have had issues with overtime. Um, the way the department is structured right now is we have three civilian uh, communication specialist positions that the union agreed to. Um, and, and I think that was really looking at the Novak study and looking and hearing about the history that was supposed to address these overtime overages and to you know, address staffing overall here at, at the department. Um, unfortunately, as things stand right now, um, there's the, the advertising has happened three times to try and fill these positions. It's been unsuccessful. Um, and really in the, in the short term, um, I don't see success coming as, as of Monday morning, there's 36 departments um, in just in Eastern Massachusetts alone that are advertising for dispatchers. Um, our neighbors um, are all suffering. They haven't been able to hire. Um, and it, it's, it's a problem that we have to deal with. So uh, we're looking to regionalize. And uh, quite honestly, I was surprised that the Novak study didn't, didn't bring this up. Um, you know, it had a considerable amount of hiring in order to address the issues and address staffing. Um, but what, uh, what really this, this looks at is uh, a more efficient, um, more cost-effective, um, way for us to uh, deliver dispatch services to the community. Uh, we were very fortunate um, to have been able to get on board with a, an existing uh, feasibility study for regionalization. Um, when I started in November, Chief Ward and I um, talked about it. Um, he had been aware of a, a potential study that was going on. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get on board in the beginning when we had an opportunity, um, but um, through some contacts that we both had, we were able to join the study. So it was a six town study with Dover, Medfield, Millis, Medway, and Holliston. And what they were looking at is the feasibility of uh, these the six communities, including, including Sherburn, um, building out uh, their own regional dispatch center or joining uh, a potentially, potentially joining an already existing center that's out there. Um, so the recommendation ultimately of the study was to join one of three uh, already existing operational dispatch centers. Um, there was no place in, in any of the six communities to, to host a center right now. 
um, there would actually need to be a building built or find and lease or buy a building for the center, um, which really wasn't economically uh, feasible. And when you look at regionalization of dispatch in the Commonwealth, it's all controlled by state, the state 901 department. And they look at what's already existing um, for its centers before they decide if they're going to approve another center. So just in our area, um, there's three centers. There's the Metacomet uh, Regional Dispatch in Norfolk, um, the Southeastern Massachusetts Regional Communications Center in Foxborough, and the Holbrook uh, Regional Communications Center in Holbrook. And we looked at all three centers. Um, we talked about it and, and evaluated the pluses and minuses. And ultimately, we visited two of those centers, um, which was uh, Foxborough and uh, Holbrook. Both are, are very incredible and impressive centers, um, but um, ultimately Foxborough is, is not going to meet our needs. It's expensive and it uh, it doesn't do some uh, doesn't perform some of the functions we would need to do um, in order to, to make it economically feasible in the long run. Um, so we looked again at Holbrook and uh, tomorrow night, um, <laughs> if all goes well. Um, this will be presented to the select board uh, with the hope of the select board uh, signing a letter of attestation to actually join the regional center. So what does that mean for us with the budget? Um, so obviously we're removing the three communication specialists um, for next year. That would have been over $142,000. Um, but the reality is, and you know, if we go back to that last slide, you know, we can look at the three-year average of overtime um, and look at what's budgeted this year. You know, we're, we're at one, we were at 147 at, at year end calendar year. Um, we're at 171 now. Um, you know, we're, we're most likely when I process payroll tomorrow morning, um, we're going to be close to going over the 192 that was already budgeted for the year. So we looked realistically at what we would need to do if we're going to transition into a regional center next fiscal year. So the state has a grant funding program that, uh, and this is kind of why things are happening quickly this, this week, um, where the, the deadline is. Um, uh, March 3rd. So if the select board uh, chooses to sign on, which I hope they do, uh, they uh, we will be part of this regionalization grant and we will work towards moving into a regional center um, next uh, January. Um, so what I did is I looked at what our costs are right now um, and what we would need to do realistically to realistically budget for overtime. And uh, we took almost you know, a little bit more than half of the, uh, the funding that we were removing for the communication specialists. We added that to the overtime line item. So for a substantial increase in overtime, um, what I will say about this increase is it's a one-time increase and we'll roll back for FY24. Um, so you know, it's, this isn't something that's gonna perpetuate. We're gonna go back to that 192 or lower. Um, and I did say that 192 or lower for FY24. So we're not gonna continue in this trend of, of overspending in, in overtime. Um, so I, I think now kind of we, we look at that, what is it gonna cost us to join? Um, and here's one of the, the huge benefits of joining. So the, the, the state, um, not only do they have a, a development grant for a regional center, which is gonna um, take care of all of our costs and transitioning, what equipment we need, making sure our radio connections there, our phone connections are there, upgrading equipment that we need to upgrade um, possibly in police cars and in fire trucks and, and portable radios. Um, but they have a, a transitional award. Um, so for the first three years, there will be zero cost to the town. Um, all of the expenses to join will be taken care of. And then our annual assessment for each of those first three years will be paid for 100% by state 901. In year four, that, uh, that will transition. The state would pick up 50% of the costs. And then in year five, uh, the state would now then pick up 25% of the cost. So it would be six years until we would actually pay a full assessment to be part of this regional dispatch center. Um, so when we looked at that, uh, we received an estimate from Holbrook. Um, so for um, FY23, the costs, and actually it's, it's kind of beyond FY23 because it's not, uh, we would be joining mid fiscal year, but for our first year being a, a member of the center would be a $295,000 assessment. Um, so they, they projected the costs out. So even when you look at year four and year five, where we would have expenditures, um, they're much less than what we're paying today. And just to kind of give you an example, when you look at our budget, um, you know, we're spending roughly $381,000 and that doesn't take into 
account all of the costs to run our dispatch right now. Um, you know, that's taking into account the three budgeted salaries for communication specialists and the way the schedules work and the rotation works. Um, you know, it's, it's a position and a half of a patrol officer that covers the desk on those other times. We have built into our, our expense budget about 20,000 in expenses. And that's split between the fire budget and the police budget because there's some uh, records management costs that get covered by both budgets. Um, and then there's benefit costs. Um, but what's not included is the overtime costs. Uh, um, all of the overtime costs really get attributed to patrol uh, and not into the communication center. And then the effects on OPEB and the, uh, the long-term um, liability that the community has. Um, so when you look at that and then you start to forecast out what year six is gonna cost the town, um, it's less than what we're paying today. Um, and it, it may seem too good to be true, but I can tell you from my past experience, um, when I was the chief in Berlin, we transitioned to a regional dispatch. They've been in the regional dispatch now for five years and uh, they didn't have the benefit of the transition award. So they, you know, we paid an assessment year one, um, but even to date, um, what they're paying today is less than what they were paying five years ago. Um, so the, the savings is real. Um, it's going to change and there'll be some operational changes here. And uh, those are some things that I'll, I will really address uh, tomorrow night with the select board. Um, but they're not, they're not cost related things. Hey, hey Chief, uh, just one question on that yes. slide. In yep. year six, is it still 25% that's covered and, and all the years beyond or does that ever no. go down to zero? So year six, it goes down to zero. So we would have 100% of the cost. So if you look at the way they forecasted the budgeting, probably somewhere around $340,000 to $350,000 would be our operational cost to be part of that dispatch. So okay. Um, and then that as compared to like our savings, I know you just mentioned, you think that it would overall be a savings, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think if you look at today, um, if you look at FY22, we're, we're spending minimum 381 plus the overages that we have in our overtime budget. Um, so what this would allow us to do is we would take those police officers that currently work the desk, they would then, they would work in police cars. So now when we have a, you know, we work now with two officers on the road, that would put three, be two officers, two patrol officers and a sergeant, which is kind of, which was the recommendation in, in Novak. And that would allow us to not have to backfill every time somebody takes a day off. Um, one of the things that has historically been an issue is that every time somebody takes a day off, we're paying somebody else overtime to cover one of those shifts. Um, we wouldn't have to do that. And not only would we not have to do that, um, when we start to talk about retention, um, we would be able to send an officer to training and not have to pay them overtime or not have to backfill their spot. We could, um, one of the other things I'm going to present in a future slide for expenses is being part of a regional uh, law enforcement council, which would allow officers to broaden their, um, you know, broaden their horizon and do different things that being in a smaller community they're not normally able to do. Um, so it would, it would increase um, their abilities as a police officer and bring a higher level of service here, but also give them opportunities to do that in other areas um, that would you know, hopefully retain them so that we don't have officers looking to go to larger agencies to do some of these specialized functions that they would now be able to do as a sheriff and police officer. So, so just recognizing that um, there are benefits to this other than um, financial, which you just mentioned, in year six, when it's three hundred and forty thousand dollars or whatnot, do you do you expect other line items to decrease in in that order of magnitude, or it'll be somewhat less than that? No, wouldn't I mean? So we would have some expense line items that there would be some reductions in. Um, the other thing that I didn't even mention, and I should mention, is um, is capital costs. So um, one thing that we would be looking at with our center over the next few years um, is upgrades. You know, we, we have to maintain the dispatch consoles. Um, you know, we're in a 20 year old building. So there could be some significant capital costs um, associated with, with continuing to maintain a dispatch center. Um, so that doesn't even factor in. You know, so we could be looking at, I, I think uh, the draft of the study is out. Um, we have in the final study, but I think they attributed to about $600,000 in uh, upgrades over the course of uh, five plus years to, the, to our dispatch center that we would not see those costs either. So it's, uh, I think when you look at this and you look on face value with the, the 381,000 that, that is really a, 
is the effect on our budget right now. You know, over this five year period, you know, you're, you're looking at close to $1.5 million in savings with the way the, uh, the grant funding is uh, available to us. Got it, thanks. Um, so that's, that's really it on the personnel cost. There was one thing I forgot and I apologize, I left out. I did um, talk about the administrative assistant position. Um, so also for supervision, um, would be looking to add a sergeant's position. Now I'm not talking about hiring a new officer. It would be a promotion. So it would be you know, taking someone from a patrol level um, and making them a sergeant to give them supervisory responsibilities. Um, and that's about a $10,000 increase. So I think that's it on personnel costs. If, uh, if, you know, if there's any other questions or if we want to move into the expenses. So, I'd like to jump in if I could. Um, yeah. Chief, my name is Steve Leahy. We haven't spoken before. Welcome to town. Um, I greatly appreciate this. First thing, I just want to confirm, Mark, um, just to be clear, I think in year six, when the total number is called 360,000, that is versus whatever the current 381,000 would grow to over those five or six years. So it's not, in a way, even though it'd be 360,000 onto our budget, that's compared to Again, whatever the current 381,000 would grow to over those six years. So I think that's likely still a net savings. That's one. And then Chief, if, if I could just ask, this all sounds fantastic. Um, just one question. So what, what could go wrong that would screw this whole thing up? What's the thing about making a audacious change like this, which I commend you for, um, what might go poorly and make this not work out for the town, whether financially or service-wise? So, so really, honestly, nothing. Um, and I, I feel very fortunate that I've gone through it before. I think the, the one concern that, that is gonna be out there and people are gonna have, and it's gonna put a lot of pressure on my shoulders is just what the public is gonna think. Um, because pe people, I think they have a, a notion of what the service level is here right now. And they may feel that we're, gonna, we're actually gonna decrease that service level, but we're actually gonna see an increase in service. We're gonna have people that are, are working the desk that have a career track that are, they want to be public safety dispatchers um, versus someone that we've hired as a police officer who doesn't want to be there. Um, they're, you know, they sit in our interviews and they tell you, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to do that. I want to sit on the desk. Well, then we run into what we just ran into. There were two officers hired, I think around December of 2020, um, you know, fast forward to December, 2021, and they both moved on and left. And one specifically cited working the desk that he couldn't, he couldn't handle that. Um, so, there really, there's no drawback. Um, I think if, if you look back five, 10 years ago, um, there were some legitimate concerns, but this is the way that, that we're moving. Um, public safety is moving into these regional centers. Um, it's not sustainable to continue to operate the way we operate. And um, to take an example, you know, we had a, a house fire uh, Christmas Eve and you know, we had a dispatcher working the desk that's never worked a house fire no experience working, working in that type of a situation where they're working multiple fires per week at a regional center. Um, you know, an example just today, um, dispatching a medical call, answering a 911 call. Um, we have one dispatcher. They're answering a 911 call. They're trying to dispatch the fire department. They're trying to dispatch the police department. They're trying to maintain radio communication with them, all while trying to still stay on the phone with the, with the caller. Um, in, in this regional center, and we've been fortunate to be able to see how they operate. And when that 911 uh, phone rings, there's three people that answer it. One person that communicates, there's a police dispatcher and a fire dispatcher. If it's a fire related call, that fire dispatcher immediately starts dispatching services and, and vice versa if it's police. And uh, you know, one thing that Chief Ward and I have had conversations about is that you know, that saves time, that saves minutes. And, and when we look at dispatching an ambulance to a medical call, one, two minutes can be a life or death you know, change. Um, so it's a huge improvement. So there really are no drawbacks. It may be perception. That's gonna be my responsibility to make sure that I effectively communicate with the public and share about it to, uh, to ensure that they the, the community understands that this is in their best interest. Thanks, I'm back now guys, so I can take back over uh, and stop talking about me. <laughs> Um, uh, Dan uh, has his hand up and then Jane after that. Yeah, th thanks, Steve. 
Um, and thanks, Chief Galvin. Um, this looks great. It looks like a really thoughtful way of taking advantage of pooling resources with some other communities to do something better at, at lower cost. Um, just one thing to just make sure I understand the issue on overtime. The key challenge on overtime is that by not having filled the dispatch positions, you're having other officers fill those, hence the need for overtime. And the big overtime chunk for FY23 is really carrying that up through January until the regional center becomes operational. And then pretty rapidly that over time, that, that particular bit of the overtime would go away. Is that is that the right way to think about it? Absolutely. And and really it's so it's it's twofold on the overtime as well, because if it's, you know, if we're filling the desk, so what that does is it creates the immediate need that anytime somebody takes a day off, we need coverage. So yes, it'll it'll you'll rapidly see after January um, a reduction in that overtime line. Okay, great. Thank you. Jane. My question was basically the same as Dan's, um, but just one additional nuance. Um, Chief, you mentioned that a couple of officers who had been hired had left by, I think you said December 21. So is is any part of the overtime issue associated with being, you know, short staffed because of those departures or have we got replacements for those folks? Um, so we're in the process of doing that now. Um, we actually had la the last selectman's meeting had one uh, new officer appointed to fill one of those vacancies um, and we're completing the background investigation on the next. Um, and actually we have two positions reserved for the May Police Academy in Lowell. And what we will be doing is actually the as these new officers are appointed, we're going to bring them in, train them on the desk so that they'll, in the sh short term, before they go to the police academy, they'll cover the desk and put the other officers on the street. So that's all in the works to, for that replacement. So there is some increase, um, especially since uh, Officer Hallisey left, left in December, um, because that created a full line that needed to be filled all, you know, um, all the time. But uh, again, that's being worked on right now to be, uh, be remedied. Thank you. Um, thanks, and Chief, uh, I apologize for having missed the beginning of your presentation and hopping on late. So I'll have a few questions that that you may have already covered. Um, so please just bear with me. Um, so I think I saw that the cost of the three comm specialists was around one hundred and forty-two thousand, right? Yeah, that would that would have been yeah what they would have been next year. Yeah, one hundred and forty. Yeah. Um, so I guess my I am. I would say that um, uh, from, a, from a purely operational perspective, um, I totally understand your um, advocating for this move to regional dispatch. It does sound like the professionally appropriate thing to do. Um, coming purely from the budgetary perspective, it, it, uh, just to give you kind of some background, I've been on, this is my fifth year on advisory and uh, each of my first, I don't know, three or four years, I was the, liaison to the police department. So I'm, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with the um, police budget and also the, the many staffing issues that um, faced the department before um, you came on. And uh, um, I, I would say that I was, I don't know, I wouldn't say that I was a driving force, but I was an encouraging force in getting that Novak study commissioned. And I am in favor of generally getting your staffing situation under control, both for the service to the town for the morale of the department, and then ideally, therefore, a reduction in the turnover and the overtime. Um, so, so, so generally speaking, I, I just want to say that I am I am in support of appropriate staffing um, for your department. <laughs> so that's that's the context here. Uh, my my question slash concern is that the 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 three communication specialist positions, the way that that was essentially um, recommended in the Novak study was to uh, basically allow for all of your sworn officers to be out on patrol duty rather than on dispatch duty. Um, and so I, I do understand that currently the way that we are um, covering dispatch, the cost to the town is $381,000. But I, I would say that the reason why the cost is that is simply because those three positions are not filled, right? So if those if those three positions were being filled internally with civilian dispatchers, I would 
um, well, I guess the, the, the whole the whole goal of the Novak study was to say that 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 should relieve a lot of that overtime pressure. Um, and so then when I see that this regional dispatch uh, plan involves paying, you know, uh, essentially getting assessed three hundred thousand dollars, and you know, in year six it'll be probably around three forty, three fifty. And understanding that the uh, dispatch officers' salaries will also be going up with COLA, so even let's give that a twenty percent uh, increase uh, over over those five years. You're looking at what fourteen plus another thirty, so one seventy two. So, so you're you're looking at around uh, half the cost of the um, the assessment from that um, regional dispatch service. So, so that's my that's my that's my one kind of thing. Like, okay. I understand the reason for it, um, but but I think we theoretically could save a lot more in the budget by actually just filling these positions internally. Um, I, that's my yeah. sort of non non expert view of it. So yeah. I, I'm I, I understand curious. what you're saying, um, but there's a li it's a little bit deeper than that um, because it, in order to actually fully staff it with lower cost civilian positions, um, we would need four and a half positions, not actually three. The way the the police union contract structured and it plays out for their schedule. So even with the three, you know, we would still be, and, and that's kind of where that 381 number comes from too, because we're looking at staffing it with three plus, you know, one and a half patrol officer positions. Um, and then that, that's not even including overtime to cover when the dispatchers take time off. Um, so I, you know, if I, if I break that out, to what it cost that that 381 actually is higher this year um, because it's all police officers versus um, having the communication the 381 actually builds in that number of communications specialists. I see. Um, so I and I can do a, a deeper breakdown of that if you want that if we went to four and a half communication specialists um, but that's the other thing that falls off the radar when we look at what we're budgeting for today um, it doesn't look at, at our long-term liabilities and, and OPEP um, because none of that's figured in. And, you know, that the, the 142 doesn't figure in the benefit costs that don't come out of the public safety budget. So, you know, we're looking at that reduction of three benefited positions. Um, so that, that 142 number jumps up. So the numbers, do, if we're looking purely salary, I completely agree. Um, but I think there's a lot of other things that play into it that causes that number to jump up. Um, more realistically to to that 381 level even today if we had those three positions filled. I see that makes sense. So okay, so I think I may have misunderstood the recommendation from the Novak study because I my understanding was that with three communication specialists, essentially dispatch could be fully covered 24/7 by civilians so you wouldn't have sworn officers manning the yeah so they, they, they work a four and two schedule. Um, so it works at like a, a week is like a six day rotation. So it takes four and a half people to cover all three shifts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I see. Um, and that, and, and the way that police contract is negotiated, it limited those communication specialists to that four and two schedule as well, not allowing them to go to a five and two schedule and being able to cover with maybe some part-time people. Um, yeah. And then also the structure of the police contract that any vacancies, so if a communication specialist takes the day off before they would get overtime, the overtime gets offered to a police officer. I see. So there's, there's a, there's a, it, it really different. I, I was actually surprised that Novak didn't mention regionalization because in 2019, this was becoming very common in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, I don't know if you've looked this deep into it and it's a bit of crystal ball predict, pre predicting the future, but if we do essentially stabilize this, the, the, the dispatch situation and uh, assuming that you do uh, maintain um, full staffing for your um, sworn officers, what, what, what number do you anticipate that your overtime would actually come down to? Because uh, I know you said, oh, you, you're not going to go over 192. I think, I think our hope was to get it significantly lower than 192 yeah, and, with all and of I, the staffing. Right. And I, I think that's what we're going to have to look at this next year and look at where our overtime is going to be spent. Um, because the reality is more of it is going to be spent on some training and some other things. Um, so I, I expect that 192 number to come down as well. But I, I, it's tough for me today 
to predict what that would be at full staff. Um, okay. It's going to take some time to evaluate that, looking at just how the operation is run. Okay. Um, all right. And and do we know for us to enter this existing um, regional dispatch? Does it just all it requires is the select board to say yes, or are there more hoops that need to be jumped through? Nope. Uh, the select board uh, has is able to sign a uh, an intermissional agreement, and uh, and it doesn't need to go to a town meeting vote. And uh, it's it's actually a pretty simple process. Okay, and it's ironclad that that a state grant will cover those first five years in the percentages that yeah. you listed there. Yeah, okay. and they actually have, they have uh, even like this year alone, they have, they have $30 million dedicated to uh, regionalization projects. Okay. Um, now the, the issue becomes if the select board is apprehensive and isn't sure that they wanna go in this direction, um, not only could we put it off a year, we could fall behind other departments that want to get on board, um, and then it could push this project out even longer. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Want to move on to expenses? Um, yeah, as long as nobody else from advisory has any uh, questions about salary. All right. Why don't you move on to expenses? So, uh, where am I going? I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. So, with expenses, um, I did make uh, some changes, and I'll, I'll go through what I highlighted. Um, a couple of them are, are bigger numbers that, uh, again, address uh, where we want to go with some uh, liability reduction and, and also retention. Um, so, I'll just kind of run through. Um, part of this has to do with the IT budget. So, the first one is... Um, is moving our copier lease from our budget into IT. Um, so that's a reduction in our, uh, our repairs and maintenance of equipment. Um, if you look at our fiscal this year, that we're already way over, um, I just found that, that there's, a, uh, there's an expense that needs to be reclassified. Um, so that's gonna be taken care of. So we're, already, we're still under budget for uh, what was planned for this fiscal year. Um, in equipment and repairs, um, there's a slight increase um, this is to address our cell block, and um, it, it's happened this year, it's happened in previous years, um, that we, we, there's a company that comes in to decontaminate and clean the cells, um, and it's, it's sometimes once or twice a year they need to come in. Um, it's a little bit more prevalent with COVID, but it's more a situation in, that happened most recently where someone who spent the weekend in one of our cells um, decided to spread bodily fluids all over the place and do different things. So we um, lose the use of the cell block. So it's, it's additional funding to be able to bring that company in to be able to decontaminate the, uh, the area. Uh, so uh, complete elimination of the telephone and internet line. Um, there's a combination of uh, things for that that is moving internet costs to the IT budget, but that also covered our vehicle hotspots for our in-car computers. Um, that's being moved into the the uh, cell phone line. Um, so it's all on one bill now. We, we transitioned to uh, AT&T FirstNet for our cell phones and for our, our, our vehicle communications. And um, so there's also, even with that transition, there's a reduction in that line. Um, we had been using Verizon and Sprint, two separate contracts. Um, we've moved it to one, and then we've been able to actually reduce that line as well um, to what the actual real numbers are for the, uh, for the fiscal year. Um, we have a reduction in postage. Um, we're using the, the town hall postage machine, but also we're, we're going to see a significant reduction in our postage costs on our detail billing. So almost daily, we're, we're sending out bills um, where we have moved to, uh, we have scheduling software that we use and the scheduling software company has a partner company that does uh, detail scheduling and billing. Um, so there's no additional costs to utilize it, um, but they're actually going to now do our detail billing for us. And what that is, is we actually charge a 10% fee with our billing. Um, so now we will split that fee with the, uh, the company. They're going to do all of our billing. Um, but the, the biggest, and biggest improvement of this is what, what currently happens now is we send our bills out. We do our, you know, our biweekly payroll. And you know, when, when we're billing for the week that we're paying for, 
we're not seeing that money for several weeks, sometimes months, um, from from the the company the vendors that we're using. Um, so with this new system, um, we'll we'll go through on on Monday morning. We'll look at all the details that are in the system. We'll submit it to the company, and by that afternoon, they'll have paid us for all the, the details. They assume all the liability. They do all the billing. They do all the collections. Um, we get we'll be able to collect 100% of the funds for every detail. Um, within a week of doing the work. So it's a huge improvement. Um, it puts money in the town's, uh, the town's pocket um, and it's gonna reduce our poaches because we're not gonna be doing administrative work to send all those bills out. Um, our water line, it's just an increase to, to reflect what we're actually spending. Um, and you know, once we're at full staff and, and what we're using, um, it, it may be able to change. I actually just made a change to, our, uh, to the water vendor um, yesterday. Um, been having some issues with the current vendor, um, so I'm going to try a new one and then see how see how they work out. Um, their pricing was slightly less than the current vendor, and then I'll make a recommendation to the other departments that also purchase water to see if it's the direction that they should go as well. Um, slight reduction in investigative supplies to reflect what we're actually using. Um, same thing with animal control. Um, and just a just a highlight on animal control as well. We're also beginning some. Uh, initial talks with the town of Holliston to look at regionalization of animal control services. So currently we pay a stipend to one of our officers um, to, to handle animal control. Um, it's not the best system. It's not necessarily having someone who is an animal control officer handling this, this situation. Um, Holliston has been joined with uh, Ashland for several years and they are, they're kind of being forced out. Ashland's too busy and can't handle the work for Holliston. And uh, we're going to begin some initial discussions with them on uh, looking at uh, potential potential regionalization of those services for the two communities. Um, so the two big ones, and I'm going to skip over um, nine for one second and just jump into the clothing. Um, the, the clothing is just a change to, um, there's two clothing line items. And you can tell me to put it back into two line items. It didn't make a lot of sense to me um, that there was, the clothing allowance and uniforms that all of the officers are using. And then there was a separate line item simply for the clothing allowance that was assigned to me. So I've just moved the two into one line. Um, and as we move forward, I think it's just simpler to track than having two line items for the same thing. Um, so the two big changes come in other expenses. And that may be a line that we need to rename because um, it's really some con contractual services and then for dues and, and memberships. And they tie together. Um, so the, the biggest increase, again, is in other expenses. Um, and I had mentioned earlier, um, looking into uh, or, or moving forward with the uh, police accreditation process. So believe it or not, in 2000, um, just about in February of 2000, the uh, Sherman Police Department applied to be part of the Massachusetts Police Accreditation Program and uh, was committed to uh, become an accredited agency. Um, you know, in discussions I've had and learned from the, the select board, um, part of what made this building possible um, was the need to, you know, the need for accreditation and that the old facility would not meet the uh, requirements of accreditation. Well, 22 years later, accreditation did not happen. So um, this is to work with a, uh, a consulting company made up of former accreditation managers to help us move through the accreditation process. Um, you know, it's much easier for larger agencies that have staff to do this. Um, you know, there's, there's over 300 standards that have to be met. Um, it's a complete revamping of our policy manual. And, uh, you know, it, it really is necessary to do that. So that's what that expense uh, relates to. Um, the other is under dues. So that includes the dues is the actual fee to pay to become a member of the state accreditation program. And also to join what, uh, what's known as the Metropolitan Law Enforcement Council, which is what I explained is a regional law enforcement group that, uh, that offers services to its member communities, um, which the offices in those member communities can be part of specialized units. So just to go on to look at accreditation, what, why should we become accredited? Um, the, the biggest thing is liability reduction, but it really, it's easy for us as an agency to look at our policies and say that we're doing the right things. Um, this is a way for us to bring in an outside agency and evaluate our policies, our operation to make sure that we are following best practices. Um, the last thing that we want to see happen is there be a problem in the way we do things 
and it be highlighted during some type of high profile event. And that becomes a huge liability issue for the community. And you know, we have the ability to, to follow the, the level of the level that we should be. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, when I walked in day one, we are not. Um, there were mandated policy and law changes um, that required some of our policies to be changed, um, and they hadn't been. Um, so to have a third party that is the one that comes and evaluates you um, and does it, uh, you know, every two years um, is a is a huge improvement for the community. Um, and I, I think if you look at it, it's encouraged by Maya by the town's insurer. They would reimburse us $625 a year for three years for the part of the costs for joining up the, it's about $1,600 a year to join um, the MPAC program. They would reimburse up to $625 a year. And if we get accreditation done in three years, which is my goal, they would continue that reimbursement. So the, uh, I think it's, it's the standard. I, I was honestly, I'm surprised that accreditation was not mandated in the police reform legislation. Um, but it's something that we should be doing and we really need to be doing. And I, I think if we're not doing it, we're, we're being negligent. Um, and then the, the other thing is, is what is the, the law enforcement council that we would join? And it's about a $4,000 expense annually. Um, but it brings some of those things in that smaller agencies don't have, can't offer the community and can't make available for their, their officers to do. Um, so they, they, this is just some of the specialized units that they have. Um, you know, so they have a computer forensic unit, they have a, an expanded criminal investigation unit, canine units, um, a regional traffic unit that does not only uh, traffic enforcement, but traffic reconstruction, peer support, SWAT. Um, there's just a lot of things out there that officers are attracted to other agencies because we don't have it. Um, it's a small fee to join. Um, and then it's kind of a trickle down from fixing, you know, joining the regional dispatch, putting more officers on the street, not having to pay overtime, where if we had an officer and three officers on the ship, we could send an officer to assist with a criminal investigation that Metrolec is doing. Um, it's going to provide us with much, you know, well-rounded officers uh, and give us a retention tool to keep people here. Um, so it, those are the two big changes in the, uh, in the expense line. Um, I think as you look at it, this is the, the whole breakdown, but it's about a 2.8% increase um, overall for the uh, the year. Thanks, Chief. Um, all right, if you want to just leave this one up there, um, I've got a couple questions about your expenses. Number one, I guess, is um, the uh, just looking at the bottom line. Um, the items that were moved out of your budget in into IT, uh, I, I believe in the spreadsheet at least, and this might be more of a question for Deb. The 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 percentage increase doesn't account for the fact that uh, certain items that were in FY twenty two uh, have been moved to a different budget, right? So then that means that. Um, you're getting a certain amount of credit for having removed IT stuff out of the FY23 budget, when in reality, those are not actually decreased expenses for the town. Right. I think, yeah, I think if you look, it would be a 3.11% increase if those items were left in. Okay, great. Okay, super. That's okay. Um, so let me see. What was the, there was one that caught my eye. Yeah, I think it was the clothing and uniforms when you were talking about sort of combining those. I can, I definitely, I see the logic of combining those two lines because it doesn't make sense to to keep them separated, at least in my mind. Um, I'm, I'm sure there was a logic to it when when the the two um, line items were were created, but but I don't I don't know the logic and I don't see it um, at this point. But when you do just look at the combination of those two things your budgeting still significantly higher than your um, three-year trend on that. Um, so I guess my question would be why, you know, co combined it's 20, you know, 20,400. And then if you look at your three-year average combined, you're still at, you know, a little under 13,000. So that's still a, a pretty significant increase relative to your three-year uh, trend. So I'm just wondering. Right, what yeah. so, so what I'm budgeting is what our contractual obligation is. 
because the clothing allowance falls under the, the collective bargaining agreement. It's in the contract. Okay. Yeah. So if we're at full staff, that 20,400 covers it. Um, gotcha. You know, since we've been <laughs> understaffed for years um, and there's been increases, you know, a few years in, in that, um, that's why that number has been lower. Um, and, you know, my thought is, and kind of what seems to happen is not everyone always spends everything. So it does stay a little bit lower, everything, but it is an obligation, a contractual obligation that I, I think we're responsible to budget for. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I guess, I don't know, similar to the question that I asked uh, Chief Ward, which is essentially, <laughs> it's, you know, every year is a tight budget year, but this year, especially it, it isn't, it isn't just that it's a tight budget year, um, but that that the budget request is extremely high for the town as a whole. You, you know, after the, after the schools, you're basically the biggest, uh, the biggest department in town. So um, I think a lot of people end up looking at the police um, budget as a possible uh, target for, can we, can we find some savings here or there? And I, I know it's challenging because the vast majority of your budget is salary of which the vast majority is set by the collective bargaining agreement. But I guess my question is, are, are there any areas in your budget that you feel like you could comfortably um, reduce something and, and, and still still be able to uh, do your job? I, I can give you a maybe. So um, I, I think there's two lines under the expense line or expense lines that we can look at if it, if it really becomes tight. Um, one is new hire equipment. So if we can get two new hires in this fiscal year and get all of the equipment purchased this fiscal year, now granted it may be tight because they start the academy in May. Um, you know, we're, we already know we're gonna have one opening next year, but you know, we, we may be able to manage with a little bit less in that line. Um, you know, the other is that I'm apprehensive to change and it's, it's been something that was just recently increased is trading. Um, but one thing I, we have noticed is some of the training we want to do is being handled um, through the state and they're handling, they're covering um, a lot more of the course costs. So although we have equipment that we need to purchase in that training with ammunition and those other things, um, we may be able to take a look at some of the, the costs for the courses and maybe be able to substitute with some similar courses that are free of charge, at least registration wise, and be able to lower that line a little bit. Um, so that's something we can talk about if it really becomes an issue. Okay. Um, and then on the salary side, I assume the, the overtime is probably the major, the major thing that, that you have the ability to, to change, right? Are there, yes. are there any other lines there that you even have the ability to alter? No, nah, everything, it's all contractual obligations. So no, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's unfortunately no. Um, uh -huh. So, it, and you know, that's where it's like, we just got to get through this year and then we're going to be able to make that correction with overtime as long as we make this regional transition. Yeah. All right. We're going to be, we're going to be putting a lot on the schools. <laughs> Going to be asking the schools for a lot of money back. Um, Jane, go ahead. Yeah, just a question, um, Chief. When you refer to contractual obligations, am I correct that a new contract would be going into effect for, uh, starting with FY23? Yes. Yeah. So, so this is, these numbers are based on, other than the um, estimates that have been made in the salaries. But the, uh, the other, the clothing allowance and those things are based on the current collective bargaining agreement. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. All right, any other, any other questions um, or comments from advisory? Oh, I did have one question just because you were mentioning the regionalization policy for animal control. Yep. Uh, do you have any idea what the cost of that is? No, it's, it, that, this is really just 
initial, the Holliston police chief sat in my office. We had a yeah. couple of a brief conversation. Um, his town administrator is, uh, is interested and really we're gonna see where it goes. Um, yeah. My hope that is that if it's something that develops, um, we can look at the community compact or some other grant programs to kind of get the initial funding um, off the ground. But it, it's gonna take an analysis of what our calls are and what their calls are and what costs could be. Um, so it's yeah. too early to even think about. How, how does that even work? Like who becomes the animal control officer? That, that depends. It could be a third party. It could be, it could be a contracted service. Um, it, it may be just a change in how we do things um, with, you know, we, we have a police officer assigned uh, at it now. Um, it could be increased responsibility for that officer and we get supplemental funding from Holliston. It could be vice versa for them. They, they use, a, uh, you know, they have an actual animal control officer that's, I believe, an Ashland employee. Um, I see. They pay in a supplement for. So it may be that they could hire someone and that we would pay into that to cover the services that we need. Um, it would take an analysis of, of call volume and, um, and what the expenses are to try and figure that out. So it's, it's, yeah. it's going to take some time to get there, but it's just on the horizon. Okay, thanks. And my only concern is that it's, you know, the, the stipend in your budget is very small for that. So it, that does not look to me like a thing where regionalization is going to result in a, in a cost savings, you know? <laughs> no, it, 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 I think you're right. But the, the problem is, is, the town's really not getting the service they should. We're not getting the, the enforcement actions, the licensing enforcement, and the things that kind of come down through the town clerk's office that, with responsibility to animals that, uh, that we should. Um, yeah. It's kind of one of the, I, I don't know how it really came to be. I'm still learning, um, but I know the person that does it doesn't really want to do it and their heart's not in it. And I don't know yeah. of anyone else that's interested in it. So then it yeah. would be coming down to ordering someone to do it on our right. end. And it, it could become an issue. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Jane, go ahead. Um, well, Chief, I, and I don't know if this is a, a question for you specifically, or I don't know if Chief Ward is still on the line, but I, I thought I heard you say that there was um, $30 million, did I hear you say, in the state budget for to help with regionalization? And I'm just wondering if I assume that wasn't just specifically in the context of dispatching, right? It's probably broader than that. Um, no, that 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 actually thirty million dollars is actually all just for dispatching. So oh. that is that comes from um, what the money that we all pay into with our cell phones. Um, so there's a, the state nine one one fund that that is all completely governed by state nine one one. So that's only for those. There's a lot of other money available for other regionalizations, and that's where the community compact and those other things come into play. And is there anything else, I, I, I don't know, if either from your perspective or if Chief Ward is still on the line, you know, any other, any other opportunities there for regionalization, especially if there's, you know, state money available? There's a lot, and we could really get into that. Um, I, I went down the rabbit hole of actually trying to regionalize police departments before. Um, it's that, that, that's really the future. I think we're way out ahead. I mean, that's, it's really early to start talking about that. But at some point, you know, I, I don't want to regionalize myself out of a job. But let's let's think realistically. Do we need to look at look at the six communities alone that we did a regional dispatch regionalization study on? Could we manage that with one police department? You know, reduce some of the administrative overhead and have a larger area to cover, but cover it with one police department. Absolutely could happen. It's starting to happen slowly with some of the really small communities in the Commonwealth. Um, and it's going to be here before we know it. But th those are things that in the future. We, we can start to talk about and start to start to look at. Um, you know, the fire, the fire service has a great model in, in how they do district fire services. Um, so, you know, it's almost looking at that model for policing as well. Jane, do you want me to address the fire side of that? Sure, that'd be great. So, so yeah, like Chief Galvin said, you know, we belong to fire district 14. So we pay a flat fee of like uh, $3,400. That's in our dues and subscriptions line. So instead of us having like our own divers and technical rescue people and uh, investigators and some of those things, the district covers that for that fee as part of a regional team. Um, as far as us regionalizing the fire department, um, I think we'd be a, a lot tougher to do because we're kind of different than a lot of our neighbors. The, both, both the way we fight fires and the makeup of the department, you know, 
and I believe a committee in Sherburne actually looked at that 10 years ago. I think the name of the committee was the future of the Sherburne Fire Department, and they looked at that, and I think they um, recommended at the time not regionalizing. I'm not saying it's off the table for the future. It probably will be at some point, um, whether that's five years from now or 10 years from now or two years from now. I don't, I don't know, um, but... I, I can certainly see why you thought the 30 million though was for regionalization of uh, other services. It's a lot of money, you know, so. Thank you. Um, one last question, uh, Chief Galvin. You were mentioning uh, with the accreditation that uh, there was a membership into the, was it Metrolec? That was that, about- That was a separate, that's similar like what uh, Chief Ward just talked about with the fire district. Okay, um, so it's essentially a district. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the way that that works, uh, so you said it was something like four thousand dollars a year or something, yeah. right? Was the 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 dues? Uh, yeah. So then, uh, it sounded like then our officers would have some more opportunities available to them in terms of assisting other communities with various you know things, and I would assume that also that means that that list of, of services um, would then be available to Sherburne as well if we were to call on them. Absolutely. And, and is there an additional um, cost for using those services or is it just the membership? No, nope, just the membership. Okay, great. Great. So do you want me to move to capital? Um, yes, please. So just one capital item. Um, and that uh, is the replacement of, uh, I had to do this because Chief Ward had a nice capital presentation last night and I didn't. Um, so we, uh, we're gonna be replacing one of our interceptor SUVs with a uh, Ford responder pickup truck. Um, so our entire fleet now is SUVs. Um, and unfortunately, even with the SUVs, it, it limits what we can do. Um, you know, there's, there's boxes in the back that carry equipment. Um, so, you know, we have a difficult time if we're, we're collecting large pieces of evidence even bicycles, things like that. Um, so this would provide us the utility. It's still a completely functional and rated as a, a police patrol vehicle. Um, so similar to what, what's done with the SUVs. Um, it, it's also gonna help us with some of our training activities. Right now, um, you know, we don't have our, our own uh, firearms um, training range. So we have equipment here that we have to haul to uh, different facilities when we do our training. We have officers that are utilizing their personal vehicles to do that. Um, it's just not a good practice. Um, so th it's the same price point as, as looking at um, any other patrol vehicle um, now. And it's, uh, it's really the best direction for us to move for, for one vehicle, not for all of them. Um, and that's what we would be looking to do for next year. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to talk about with it is the, the way we pay for it. Um, when I listened to Heidi present the budget on debt services, um, and she used the example a few weeks ago of the, the $99,000 this year for police vehicles. Um, I, I, was, I was a little bit shocked at the final number that's paid back. Um, so I did a little bit of investigation on some alternatives and uh, I looked at a municipal lease program. So I, I kind of broke this out over, over five years about what our costs would be if we were to turn to municipal leasing. Um, so just first of all, to be clear, municipal leasing is not the same as one of us going out and, and leasing a per, a, our vehicle. It's really just a, a municipal financing plan to, uh, to be able to purchase um, any type of equipment. Even the, 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 uh, the breathing apparatus that Chief Ward uh, presented could be um, tied into a, a municipal leasing program. Um, so I, I got one estimate. I'm actually um, been talking to another company um, about an additional estimate. Um, but if we were to take the FY23 purchase of a, a police vehicle and break it out over five years, similar to what Heidi was doing with the bonds, um, you know, we'd be looking at about a 13,000, it was under 13,000, but about a $13,000 payment a year for those years. Um, you know, the, the interest rates are, are very competitive. Um, if we were to get that number for borrowing over $100,000, um, the rates would come down. Um, and then, you know, again, as we go even higher, the rates would come down further. So it's just, a, it's another option to look at as you think about how we finance some of these capital items. Um, you know, we still retain the vehicle at the end for a dollar. Um, you know, so it's, uh, 
you know, again, and I, I just looked at the $99,000 from this past fiscal, you know, this, this current fiscal year. And uh, with what Heidi had forecasted, if we had done it the same way through this municipal lease program, um, we'd probably be saving six to $8,000 over the five years. So um, it's something to consider. Um, and I just thought, it, you know, I should present it, at, you know, when I looked at the way we were purchasing. Are there disadvantages to leasing? Um, none that I have seen. It's actually become much more widespread. Um, there's no penalty for early payoff. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just a way for the town to finance, similar to going through debt services and, and, use, and utilizing bonds. And who, who sets the sort of like leasing rates? So there's, there's a, a variety of companies um, that do that. Um, the company that I got the, uh, the rate from, they're actually based out of um, uh, Sandwich Mass. Um, there's another company, which I believe is the largest one in the country that I'm dealing with. It's, I think it's first rate municipal leasing um, that I'm waiting for a quote on. And, uh, um, you know, they base it off the market um, and uh, it, it kind of works from there. So I, I can get you more information. I'll, uh, I'll send you the sample quote that, I, that I've received. Um, because it's something, I don't know if it's something you may want to consider as we move forward. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, looking at all the options is good. I, you know, I certainly, this is more of a, a topic for capital budget to bring up with you, but, um, you know, I think that, you know, they and us, and certainly, um, the treasurer wants every department to have a you know, a full five-year capital plan laid out. Um, I know that I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not aware of that being fully fleshed out for the police department. I think probably because of the, the interim um, um, situation. Um, but I do know that Lieutenant Bento had been working on sort of essentially um, looking at the, the police fleet and figuring out um, whether it made sense to have more take-home vehicles and you know essentially looking at different options. And I think that that's something that, that, uh, that, that we're gonna want you to basically work on is essentially a five-year plan for- yeah. and, and actually that's, that's also, kind of where these numbers came from, um, conversations I've, I, that I've had with him um, and, and you touched on the take-home vehicles. Um, so we've actually made some changes in how that has been happening. Um, so other than the you know, contractual administrative take-home vehicles, there are there's no longer any patrol take-home vehicles. Um, everything's back into a rotational portion of the fleet. So um, you know this is this was kind of looking at that, looking at what he had started to build, and looking at what our needs are. I did I did present or, or included with the capital request for this year um, the five-year build-out for vehicles. And then there was actually one other item within that capital plan for the next five years. Great. Um, and I also know that um, Paul Dorensis seems to be on a kick with the electric vehicles, but you know, I, I think that truly it is, you know, it's going to be the future of, of all vehicles, but certainly uh, municipal vehicles as well, um, whether that future is a couple of years from now or a decade from now, I don't know, but it's it's something to strategize, right? So I, I agree. Do you have a do you have a vision for that? A plan for that? I, or are there to grants? To be honest, um, my plan had been that this pickup truck was going to be a hybrid, um, but unfortunately, with the 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 state of the uh, motor vehicle uh, market in the United States, they actually shut down pre-orders. So for for a municipality to actually order a police vehicle for next fiscal year. Um, we would have had to have ordered it in September. Hmm. So um, when I when I started looking at vehicle options and talking to the vendors, um, there was no option for a pickup truck as a hybrid. So because they had placed their own stock orders, um, we're able to be assigned one of those vehicles, but it's it's an all gas. Um, but as as we look in the future, alternative fuels are uh, very much on my horizon. So I don't know if you had heard this before. But uh, my last take-home vehicle for the you know, community I worked for previously was a plug-in hybrid Chevy Volt. Um, so we are, you know, and, and it's, it's in my kind of mindset to start to look to move that way, um, looking at what will be replaced next year and looking at what's starting to become available. Um, that, that's really the drawback on the police end 
is is the the upfitting, the adding all the accessories and the additional lights at the end is they haven't they haven't done a lot of that. Um, Ford has taken now the Mustang Mach E and is using it to, and trying to do some upfitting. There's actually a few departments here um, and that have purchased them um, in a semi-marked or unmarked uh, status. But uh, as we you know we we still need to have the sedan in that type of vehicle. So looking at those, we're definitely looking at um, either all electric or full hybrid. You know, that's going to create a bigger discussion because we would need charging stations and those things to go along with them. Um, but that's the direction I plan to move in, um, you know, and that kind of take our reliance off of gasoline, which you hope, uh, you know, it's kind of twofold. We, uh, you know, we, we change the way our budget is a little bit. We become more efficient and then we take some of the, the, uh, the fuel usage away from the town um, from other budgets as well. Um, last question for me, the, um, the vehicle that you are replacing with the pickup, is there a, um, a trade-in value or, or auction value for that vehicle? So yeah, auction value is kind of unknown at this point. Um, it, it, we'll see where the market is. Um, I, do, I can tell you, we just auctioned one and some funding went into that surplus account. Um, you know, we, I, I was kind of shocked. It was a, it was a 2016 uh, 108 or so thousand miles, and uh, we got 11.6 for it. Okay. So the the auction value was impressive last year. Um, so there there is some potential for it. Really depends on where the the market is at the time. I'll tell you, it's and much you, better than the trade in value. Okay. And do you know uh, in your cut of the um, surplus equipment revolving fund? Do you know how much the police department has allocated in that right now? Um, I have to double check with Deb, but she, we just submitted a check to her uh, earlier this week. Um, so I'm guessing we're probably somewhere in the fifteen thousand dollar range right now. Um, unfortunately, um, I, I'm st stuck with about a six thousand dollar equipment bill on vehicle equipment that is uh, that needs to well that needed to be paid in September um, or October that wasn't paid. Um, so some of that funding that we just took in, I think, is going to need to go to cover that equipment expense. Um, okay. So to cut us cut us down to about six or seven thousand, um, but that's probably where I think where we're going to be we'll stand. I have a meeting with Deb tomorrow about some other things, and uh, I can confirm those numbers. Yeah, I think I I do think that sounds about right. Great. Um, all right. Uh, anyone from advisor have more questions for the police chief? Um, all right, I think that's it then. Um, I guess uh, we'll just kind of have to keep in mind that uh, there's a couple line items that you might be able to reduce uh, in a pinch. Um, we'll see. We'll see how everything else goes um, with the rest of the departments, but um, it's 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 possible we're going to be coming back to you to ask for a bit back. But yeah, I'll I'll do some more digging and see what it, what it is and try and come up with a realistic number um, and, and where we can go with that. Great. All right, thank you. Let me kick you off screen there. Um, all right, next we've got select board legal. And I think we've sort of wrapped IT and then also sustainability into this sustainability mainly, mainly because that also used to be under select board, but I believe Diane is here and uh, Dorothea is also here. Um, so I guess, uh, Diane, what, which, which, which of your budgets do you want me to pull up first? Why don't you pull up the selectman's budget? Okay. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Okay, so you know the select board met on uh, February 3rd and reviewed this budget and they made basically three changes to it. They uh, lowered the TA salary down to 150 and they added a line item for human resources support for $10,000 and then added another um, $10,000 to the consulting line item. There was a, a, a big discussion amongst the board members about 
having more human resources available uh, for the town. And rather than hire, uh, you know, another body for 15 or 19 hours a week, they thought that they could get a consultant and then have um, some human resources support for that consultant that would either be fall in the town administrators as a stipend for the town administrator or a stipend for the assistant town administrator. So uh, do you want to go line by line? How do you want to work this, Steve? Um, oh, yeah, just uh, okay. just go down and I don't know, just uh, pick, pick out the, uh, the things that have either significant increases or decreases and just let, let us know what it's about. Okay, so um, I don't really, the only one I really wanted to talk to you about that I thought maybe would stick out with you guys is the, um, the senior tax credit program. Because you can see that um, we haven't utilized much of the funds in that. And so I um, spoke with the Council on Aging Director and I actually spoke to the fire chief the other day about utilizing some of the senior tax credit people. And because of COVID, we haven't been able to really bring anybody into the office. There are a few that have come in, but not like before. And um, I, I'd like to try and revamp this whole program to see if I can uh, reach out to more seniors and maybe find something that they could maybe do from home, like, you know, fold the link or make some phone calls. You know, I, they seem to be a little nervous about coming into the office right now. Maybe once things quiet down a little more, they'll be um, more willing to come in. So, you know, I know when the program first started, it was funded with $7,000. And if you signed up, you got $10 an hour and you could work up to a hundred hours and you would get a thousand dollars off your tax rate. So you wouldn't be actually getting paid, but you'd get a decrease in your tax rate. So over time, now that the uh, you know the pays are going up, we're giving them four. I uh, think let me see. I wrote it down. Fourteen dollars and twenty five cents an hour, because that's the hourly rate right now. So instead of working a hundred hours, they're working roughly around seventy one hours. You know, I could lower it, but I'm going to ask the advisory board if they could just give me one more year with this and see if I can turn it around and see, because I think there are some seniors that could use the help off their taxes. I think I just need to do a little more digging and outreach with them. And I think that the Council on Aging Director would work with me on that. So as far as the other things, um, let me see, there was the printing and mailing. Um, let me see, year to date. Well, no, I don't really, I don't know, do you see anything that sticks out at you? Because I don't. Um, what is, what is uh, 5318? It says code, code red. Oh, okay, that's the reverse 911. Originally, that originated in the Board of Health office and then got moved to the select board's office. I'm not even sure it should be in the select board's office budget or be in either maybe police or fire budget. So you've now you've received reverse 911 messages that have been put yeah. out by the police department of fire. That's what that is. Okay. Okay. And so is that like uh, an annual like subscription to be able to do that service or something? Yes, every I year we see decide. that. Okay. Yes, yeah, because I see contract. that. So, right, because year to date, you're already you've already basically uh, more than maxed it out. So I assume that was right. just a one time cost for the year. Yes. Okay. Um, Uh, all right. Well, I think that's otherwise all pretty straightforward. Anybody else from advisory have any questions or comments? Yeah. Hey, it's Steve Lee here. I've got a question. I'm sorry. Was someone else asking a question? Uh, no, go ahead. So uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on mobile. I don't have my screen in front of me. Diane, just real quick. So um, decrease the town administrator to 150 and then did you say there was a line item of ten thousand dollars for HR and a separate line item for ten thousand dollars? Yes, there's a, a uh, yes, there's a, a line item for HR resources support for the HR consultant that the select board would like to bring on board. 
So a total and of that 20, consulting thousand. line item went up by about ten thousand. And so, so again, I'm sorry that I'm not in front of the screen at the moment. So is that a total increase of twenty or ten? Twenty. Ten in the HR, and then ten on top of the consulting line item. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm just looking for that other ten, Diane. Is that? Well, if you go to the consulting line item, it was. Um, well, we had brought it in one... nine thousand. When we brought it to the select one, we only had nine thousand plugged in. Oh, well, because uh, oh, I'm okay, not okay. quite sure where that twenty-five thousand came from. <laughs> okay. Steve. okay, great. <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to think. We're going to uh, bring it down to nine, and we presented it to the select one with nine thousand. Okay. And then they put ten on it. Yeah, I'm trying to think because uh, surely we would have asked about that twenty five thousand last year, but I don't I don't remember Absolutely. what the, I, I, I can't I don't remember what the explanation was. Yeah, yeah, there's not there's nothing in my notes at in the budget book why it was twenty five thousand dollars and Diane and I had a discussion about yeah, it. We, we had no idea what it was anything. there for. And you've only expended eighty seven dollars out of that out of that account right. so far. So it's right. it wasn't like it, it was already planning on doing something, you know, in the fall. And no. Nope. <laughs> um, right. okay. We don't know where it came from. All right. Well, well, that was a built-in way to make it look like your budget's uh, coming in low this year. So, <laughs> good, good thinking ahead, I guess. You and David Williams. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. What's the, what's the nine thousand there for? We had Excuse we had me? plugged in the nine thousand dollars, kind of based on FY twenty one. I think that some of the expenses in FY21 included like different um, consultants that came in for team building and for, uh, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure what, but I just, we just used the FY21 9,000 as kind of a basis. That's what we left in there sure. when we built the original budget before the additional 10,000. So do you know of, um let's say $9,000 worth of stuff that you have planned for the remainder of this fiscal year um, in terms of consulting services? Uh, it's hard for me to say right now. I'm not, I'm not 100% certain yet on that. Maybe. You know, Cause just looking at like the 9,000. Maybe 9, entering into a contract into a contract with we're them. considering entering a contract with a consultant um, to help us with the APA at this with point. The, and that would probably oh, right, be about nine thousand dollars. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Roughly around uh, nine grand. Yeah. Sean, Colleen, you got your hand up. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Uh, in the past there's also been a few other consultants that um, were hired we we didn't this past year a couple of them were for you know tracking the general chemical uh, where people might think that falls under the board of health but they don't they don't carry that much for consultants um so there was there was some professional services there that were covered i think that probably contributed to some of that past couple of years mm. and and it will be coming back it's not always uh plan per se we can plan it but we can't always time it because uh, we're kind of in that instance we're kind of chasing epa and dp uh DEP. So it ebbs and waves as, as things happen do any 40b related consultants go into this line or are th those are usually covered by the developer right yeah yes, that, nothing would come out of that line item for that yeah okay um okay okay um all right any other questions or comments about this budget well, I'm sorry if I missed this, but why is the why is the HR support in two different categories? 
some well, consulting. I, and some I think what they're looking to do is hire a consulting company to do part of our HR. But that consultant will need some HR support through the select board's office. So that's what that's for, to support the consultant that we're only going to be paying probably about I have no idea what the what the going rate is now. I have we haven't even started looking into it, but that's what that is to support the consultant. The, the ten thousand is the salaries. Yes, it's under the listed under the salaries. It says human resource. It says board of selectmen human resources, but it really probably should say board of selectmen human resource support. And ultimately, that would be a stipend that was being paid to either the town administrator or assistant town administrator. Yes, whatever the select board decides. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, you know at the select board meeting there was a lot of discussion on how they should move forward. I think was. there was really no consensus as to should it be an employee. You know, like should they hire a an HR person to work part time, maybe you know shared with another community, or if they should hire a consultant or if they can do a consultant with, you know, a current employee with a stipend. And I, I think between the, the two line items, it was kind of a placeholder. It's still a little, you know, a discussion point, but something needs to be done, I think was the consensus. Okay. So essentially they decided to budget $20,000 for HR related services. Exactly. Split into into split into two buckets. Yes. Correct. Okay. All right. Any other questions about this budget? All right. If not, uh, Shall we move on to, wait, am I missing any? No, no, no. All right, yeah, that sheet's no good, right? Okay. Uh, next, what do we want? We've got IT, legal, sustainability. Well, I can, I can tell you that the uh, legal budget is still going to get funded at the $80,000. They've not, okay. they've not going to move that, that line. It's All going right. to stay just like at, at that. Great. That's done. So if you want to, um, unless there's a question about it, we can move on to the IT. Does anybody have questions about legal? All right, here's IT. So for the IT, we have the big guns here. We have Sean and Klaus Allman um, and um, to walk everybody through this and Deb will help walk it through with the, with the numbers. Okay. All right, well, I guess whoever feels most qualified to discuss this budget, uh, feel free to take it away. Hi everybody, this is uh, Klaus Allman. I guess I'll, I'll jump on the grenade. Um, all right, so this is, um, this budget you guys have seen tonight actually is sort of a culmination uh, of a number of discussions that have been happening over the last probably six to 12 months, um, mostly from the perspective of direction from the uh, Board of Selectmen to, uh, to really start to create um, a new IT um, account essentially. Um, inclusive of working towards a more of a dedicated IT position longer term. Um, there's lots of discussion around that, um, but I think uh, to date we've uh, I've been working directly with Sean uh, as well as uh, David Williams, um, Diane, uh, and as well as some of the other department heads uh, to look at uh, centralizing a lot of our common operational IT spend into what's being proposed tonight. Um, so that's, you know, this sort of uh, it does go through a number of the items that you've heard already from um, Chief Ward and Chief Galvin, 
in regards to some of the removal of the IT operational IT spend out of their budgets uh, and then bring being consolidated into this line item budget. So sort of with that as the backdrop, I guess I'll go line item by line item and, and you guys just let me know if you have any questions along the way. Um, and the top line item is the, the BOS IT support. Um, this is really the opportunity the, uh, the, the select board has put into place to try to carve out a salaried position for that. Um, you know, previously this, there was no budget for that. Um, you do see a year to date cost uh, and that accounts for the, the stipend that is being paid to me as a, um, as I provide IT services for the town um, for a, a number of hours per week. Um, and then we have looked to increase that. Um, it's not necessarily a salary increase per se, but it's to continue to build on um, effectively working towards more of a either a, a full scale part time position or a full time position in IT support um, for the town in the longer term. Um, and then I guess let me let me pause there first and see if, if anybody has any questions specifically about that. I'd like to hop in, Klaus. This is Steve Leahy with a quick question. Uh, so, you know, I, I recall a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago, formally, um, we put the title of like IT director under the town administrator, uh, I think along with HR roles as well. And so are we, is the goal here to specifically separate the role of kind of IT administrator for the town away from town administrator? Uh, you know, I think it's a good question. I would certainly ask uh, Deb and Diane to jump in on this too, but it's been my understanding that it, I don't think so. I think effectively, um, you know, fundamentally that will roll up to uh, the um, administrator of the town. So it still is under their scope. But I think this is more of a functional salaried position to actually um, perform the IT duties for the town. Thank you. Diane, Deb, I don't know if you have any, any comments on that, if I'm, no, if I'm I, I, vocalizing I it well. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. This is like a new department that falls under the selectman's um, purview, so, or under the town administrator's, you know, reins, if you will. So the, the town administrator is ultimately responsible for it, but, you know, depending on what happens with the town administrator, if that person's going to be, you know, IT, savvy or not you know we definitely need somebody who can do the technical aspect of the it work i certainly agree and you know it seems clear to me that putting that role under the town administrator didn't work out great so i'm happy i know that klaus you are helping out where you can but uh i am in favor of making this somehow um the role of IT support at a town level with a view to have a uh, holistic view of the entire town's technology needs uh, and, and the support of that. So from a strategic and tactical level, I think that is an important role that we do need to have, whether as an individual role or, uh, or I think as you're saying, that role would be kind of a part-time role, but would report into the town administrator. So I'm happy that we're thinking differently of this than what we had been thinking, or than how we had been thinking of it. Excellent, thank you, Steve. All right, so if we move into the, the line items, um, I guess we'll just go down through. Um, for IT equipment, um, you know, again, as stated, this is really for a small scale replacement uh, of IT equipment that was uh, not necessarily expected you know, mice, keyboards, cables. Um, uh, we kept it at the at the $2,000. This is really um, pretty, you know, we would have expected this to be the sort of uh, the three level, uh, three year average. Um, we're not really sure why there wasn't any actual spend in FY20. We just think it, it sort of got buried or reclassified in, in other areas. Um, uh, again, I think, I think that's pretty modest. I, I, I think we'll probably come in under um, on that, but, uh, but you know, again, IT equipment and one specific thing like a printer or a projector, you could easily go way over on that. So that it's, it's tough for me to classify that, not necessarily having all the background. Um, 
The next one, the IT rental lease. Again, this is sort of a consolidation effort here to, uh, to utilize a, a, a standardized process for rental and lease of equipment, um, particularly for printers and copiers. Um, we have one each situated uh, at both the town halls, well, the police department. Um, it was always like many of the other services being done at an individual department level. Um, this will allow us to sort of bring it together, whether we do it as, as different contracts because there's different needs for the two different or multiple departments, or we, we work to consolidate that under a single contract that certainly can be done. Um, but that cost is directly being, um, being put forth based upon what was being pulled out of previous budgets already set. Um, consulting fees, um, you know, this one's a, a kind of a tough one. Um, the consulting fees, you've actually see that we've sort of guided this down. Um, and I think that's partially to reflect that we're working to put more money into a dedicated IT um, individual, whether it's a stipended position or move towards a, a, a true full-time, a, a true part-time position um, in the short term. Um, we do believe that we're going to be able to uh, down guide for uh, the amount of consulting that we'll need um, moving forward. Um, we, we do anticipate that uh, Kevin Whitman, who has been providing a lot of the consulting IT uh, needs for the town, again, across multiple departments, um, he will still, uh, his services will still be utilized in a variety of different ways. So we, you know, we have, uh, we believe that it's important to keep that in there, um, you know, so that that's why that's not necessarily going to a zero role. Um, on the network support side of things, uh, again, this is, it, you know, there's two different sections here. Uh, network support often comes in the form of both consulting as well as some support contracts that we have. Um, we do have a number of support contracts for existing network-based equipment in town, um, and that's really where that $5,000 line item is coming from. Uh, the People GIS software, that is a software that's actually used by multiple different departments. There has been some discussion to date about moving this particular line item into a, a, a different uh, department line item um, based more upon of where it's truly being used because People GIS software does not actually get utilized by all departments, um, which is sort of the spirit of what we're trying to do in the consolidation efforts here. Um, that said, you know, because those conversations haven't truly happened yet, um, we decided to keep it in the, the line item budget um, and again, just keep it static from the fiscal year 22. Uh, cable TV charges, again, this is just a consolidation. It has not existed to date in this particular uh, line item set. So we're pulling in the, um, the cable TV charges from the various departments and pulling that into a common uh, category. That's where the 2000 comes from. Um, equipment service contracts, uh, again, very similar. That has not existed before. Um, some of it was at the town, uh, I'm sorry, the select board level. Um, it may have been categorized as something different. And then there's some other areas there where we were pulling it in from um, uh, different departments. Um, the, the majority of that goes for the direct support of our townwide phone system, um, which includes a number of network components as well as all the individual phones within the department. Um, there's a miscellaneous services. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not necessarily having the background myself. I was, uh, I'm not sure where what's supposed to be categorized in this. I think it was sort of a little bit of a catch-all. We've guided it to zero. I think at this point in time, I think we feel comfortable with all of the other line items that we've created or categories we've created. Um, we should be able to capture everything there uh, without necessarily using the miscellaneous services, but we will continue to track it because we know that there's been a you know, moderate couple hundred dollars here and there over the last couple of years that were categorized towards it. Uh, phone charges, I think, is one of the bigger items. Um, again, they're we're looking to consolidate um, all of the landline based phone charges um, across the various departments of the town. Um, the town hall and police department being the sort of primary two uh, that are using the majority of the phone lines. Um, this is a, a sort of direct pull of what we anticipate spending for our services that we already have in place. This doesn't necessarily um, take into account anything additional we would wanna add. Uh, but at this point in time, I think we feel comfortable that there really isn't going to be much of an ad from here. Um, as a matter of fact, it, we, we are looking to try to see if there are elements of which we can um, pro provide some savings through this consolidation effort. Um, but unfortunately, that effort hasn't taken place just yet. We're still trying to, to get our heads wrapped around of pulling all of this together. 
Um, very similar on the internet charges. Um, that is completely separate because it doesn't always happen that it's the same service provider for all the different departments. We are working to go with a, a common process and a, a common vendor for the IT charges. Um, but that is a direct line item for the pull-in of the interdepartment budgets that we have, um, have designated for the internet service fees across all the departments. Um, monthly software maintenance. This is really the software licensing um, for a lot of the services we use. We've we've downguided this slightly because we think we're we're going to be able to to um, you know some of this has already been paid forward because we do have a number of multi year contracts. Um, and then some of it is for the uh, additional services, depending upon the sort of wax and wane of number of employees across the town that may need an email address or, or, or access to Word and Excel type of thing. So um, I think that's actually a pretty modest and we've kept it the uh, same as from fiscal 22. Um, cybersecurity is the next line item. Again, this is a new line item because it really does need to be created um, to account for some of the efforts that are taking place specifically for the protection of the electronic assets of the town. Um, obviously, a number of years ago, we did encounter a malware attack, which was pretty, a pretty significant one um, for the town resources um, and cre created quite a disruption in service. Um, so we have entered into a number of multi-year contracts to date and for the protection of this one, which we started just this past year. Uh, and that line item is a, is a direct cost on that uh, multi-year contract that has been put in place um, for the, the total cybersecurity system. Um, website maintenance, it's pretty self-explanatory. We obviously have a small uh, service fee that we pay for the various websites of the town. Um, we're keeping that static, uh, even though the three-year average is a little bit more, um, we do see that there, are, there could be some savings in there and we're trying to be modest about it and, and really kept it uh, close to that fiscal 22. Um, software licensing, this is a little bit different from the software maintenance. Um, there are some software packages that the town utilizes either for security or for um, just for uh, general services and operational expenses. Um, and then that's where some of a lot of that software licensing is now going to be consolidated into from some of the other departments. Um, and then the last one is the other expense. Again, this is a, a kind of a catch-all line item. Um, we kept it zero the same way we have in the past number of years. Um, you know, hopefully it's not something that we have to utilize. Um, and again, I think you know, as we continue to move forward, we can evaluate whether or not this is a, a valid category for this uh, for the IT budget. Wow, <laughs> a lot of effort went into this, huh? Yeah, Klaus did a fantastic job. Um, I, I just wanted to say that if you look like at the history, the history is is there because what I did was I took the the line item from the from the different departments where it was coded previously. So, like in FY nineteen, we charged all the IT expenses to town building, and then in FY twenty, some of the uh, IT expenses went to the board of selectmen and some of them went to town building. And then last year, all the expenses went to the board of selectmen's budget. So that's why those, those, you know, we, we have been spending about 75,000 the last two years on IT expenses. So even though this is like a new department and it has a $108,000, we've already experienced 75,000 of it. And we've taken, uh, like Klaus kind of outlined it for me, we've taken about 37,000 from other departments. So really, you know, we're, it's about the same, but it's just all under one department now. Yeah, that was going to be my, my question is in terms of how, how this budget actually reflects on IT spending. So you're saying that it is actually pretty close to flat in terms of the the IT spend across the entire town. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I actually had it about it's it's about a one and a half to two percent if you're you know if you're calculating the numbers um, uh, increase from um, previous year budgets. Um, that includes about the 35 to 37,000 that we expected to pull from other departmental budgets into this one. Um, so I, again, I mean, it's not much of an increase considering I think this really reflects what we're already spending um, or our contracts that we've already entered to for the town. 
Okay. If I can jump in real quick, you know, um, the when one frustration that I have, and Deb, I, I trust that, you know, if this, if this 98,000, I'll call it 100 grand, is really being pulled and is taken out of the other budgets, I sure wish one of the other budget department heads said, oh, and by the way, we're down on this line item because we're turning this over to the IT department. Well, um, so. uh, the, the, police, uh, the police and the fire did say that. And if you kind of uh, go back to what I did for, like, say, the Board of Selectmen, yeah. I actually removed that line item from their budget gotcha. and brought it down below their totals so that when you were comparing, uh, you know, year to year, you were comparing apples to apples. So thank you, thank you for the clarification. I appreciate that. Deb, you did that in town buildings. You did that in the, as well. Yeah, I just, the, because the if I would have kept those in their previous year actuals then then you would have been able to see you know okay yeah there you know five thousand dollars is not included in this year but when you looked at the totals the percentages would have been skewed so i did it kind of below the line if you will yeah and i've been i've been trying with each budget to try to kind of identify which lines are it related and to kind of figure out you know what whether things have been moved to an IT department, whether things have stayed in a department, and then whether the bottom line reflects the the movement of, of money from from one line from one department into another. Um, yeah, so I've I mean, vaguely been trying to keep on top of it, uh, but <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah, and I'm I'm not saying that we haven't missed anything, but we really have tried hard to keep track of all the moving pieces. Um, so regarding the actual plan for FY23 in terms of that salary line, is that, Klaus, is that going to be you expanding the amount of time that you're doing, or is there a plan to sort of uh, advertise a part-time position in FY23, or what, what's the plan for that actual $10,000? Actually, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I think all of those are a possibility. I think it really now needs to be a discussion by, you know, including the department heads, um, to get a you know real evaluation of where we stand for the support needs, the day-to-day -day support needs of the town. Um, you know, I know Deb has done some legwork in terms of working with some of the other surrounding towns and getting an idea of what they do. Um, we know that, say, for instance, Millis and Norfolk, they kind of they share an IT individual between the two towns, and it's not necessarily 50-50. I think it's like 40-60 or something to that regard. Um, and but they also pay a fairly significant cost, a monthly cost for a an outside service provider that's sort of their like IT helpline, if you will, that if, if somebody has a problem with their computer, they, they call them versus the individual that they're paying for provides the, the sort of planning and, and maybe maintenance and, and implementation type of services. Um, you know, I think this is really gonna be kind of a, an ongoing discussion. It was something that we started to have with David and with Diane, you know, I think given the current circumstances of Diane now being in the, you know, uh, in, that, in her position, um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving pieces. I think those discussions are still to be had, but we're certainly, you know, we'll, would love to uh, get the advisory board's uh, comments and thoughts on it too. Uh, I mean, I don't think I have any particular thoughts on, on, on how to actually do the staffing. I think that's, I mean, really it's, I think that's mostly going to be up to, you know, the, the select board and the town administrator uh, to to sort out what is the the most appropriate way to staff it. I was just curious as to what what's the actual plan, <laughs> but it sounds like it is to be determined. Basically, it, it really is, and you know I think everybody's acknowledging that at this stage of the game we're, we're very happy that we're sort of in discussions to make this a focus um, versus trying to carve out an, an arbitrary large scale number to, to hire somebody. Um, full time. So I think it's it's somewhere in between. I think the goal is to maybe eventually get there as we know that the town needs are growing. And so, uh, you know, especially with all the, the virtual efforts that are, that are happening now, um, you know, but I think this is sort of the, a stepping stone to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm mostly I'm curious because I think probably any of us who works in any kind of a company that has an IT director knows that you know that there is a particular skill there, and um, you pay people pretty well for that skill. And ten thousand ten thousand dollars probably buys you a, a month of you know a, a real professional IT director. <laughs> you know, so it's like 
Yeah, ten thousand is not very much for to to be like. Let's hire a person part time. It's like wow, it's very part time. Yeah. <laughs> See, um, there's no reason you can't move that to thirty. Yeah. <laughs> well, not. the the uh, I mean, it's at this point, it's just a matter of what's what's the plan, right? I mean, if the plan is for uh, a particular number of hours at a rate for, uh, you know, either a consultant or as a stipend or for a part-time person, it's like, if, the, if there is a data informing a, an increase to 30,000, then that's, that's fine, you know, but it's kind of like, well, it sounds like there isn't, isn't a fully fleshed out plan yet, which is totally fine at this stage. It's a, it's a, it's a brand new thing. I'm just, um, I'm I'm skeptical that the town's entire IT needs are going to be covered by ten thousand dollars of salary and five thousand dollars of consulting, you know. But, but I guess that's sort of what we've been doing up till now, right? So, um, I, mostly for me, it's just a uh, planning for the future that that the salary line in this department is going to go up steeply <laughs> in, in over the next couple of years, probably. Um, I have a question about actual computer replacement purchases. Is that basically just going to be capital um, when needed moving forward? Yeah, again, that's been an active discussion. I think, you know, echoing some of the conversations of the department heads, I think everybody's in alignment that the individual departments for the time being will still manage their, um, their IT equipment spend um, at the department level, um, whether they've already budgeted for it or they're going to go after it uh, from a, in a capital sense, that, uh, that we're not putting forth any capital items on the IT this time, um, that certainly could change in the future. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering, again, just kind of like in a, anybody that works in a company type scenario, it's like, I, I would assume that most IT departments, they just have an operating expense for computer equipment. And, you know, most probably have some kind of a you know, contracts with a, you know, business vendor for re replacing computers at a particular rate at a particular frequency. Um, that is a hundred percent true. Most do. And, and, you know, I think that's something that um, hasn't necessarily, it's been done very ad hoc, I think across the, the different departments. Um, and I think part of that is appropriate because I think the needs sometimes wax away. And I know particularly, you know, the fire and the PD are the areas that I tend to know the best. And, you know, as you can imagine, there's different things and systems that, that sort of come into place and, and sort of we move migrate away from. So, um, you know, I think at that, in, in that regard, it's definitely still to be handled by the individual departments, but I think that's one of the things that I would love to see is that, you know, again, the town starts to look at um, sort of standardized replacement costs or amortization of, you know, three to five year replacement equipment, which is pretty standard, industry standard. Um, and we take that into account in future budgets. Great. Um, and then do we know, so like with the phone and internet charges, I understand that basically we're still in the uh, aggregating everything um, stage, but do we anticipate that there would be any sort of uh, efficiency and cost savings by essentially mashing phone and internet together and essentially having, you know, a voice over IP service uh, for, for all of the town buildings and just kind of combine phone and internet all into one? Or is there a reason why that can't even be done? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, it, it actually is in place right now. I mean, the, the details of this budget don't really reflect that, but, you know, there we, we do have a townwide um, voice over IP system in place. Um, it's actually, it's worked quite well and obviously provides us a ton of efficiency, um, even to the point like, uh, you know, the, the DPW doesn't have any landline in place anymore. That's truly a, a voice over IP, um, you know, site. Uh, and so we do anticipate that there's going to be some provisions in there where we're going to be able to save cost by uh, trying to blend some of this. Um, and that is, we've already started taking, Sean and I, the first steps uh, of trying to move to a common vendor. We're, we're trying to move to Verizon and Verizon Fios for the, the service feeds for all the department uh, municipal buildings. Um, and so once we're able to do that, you know, we have some contacts at Verizon we're going to start working with to try to see if we can bring in some efficiencies or at least standardization of services. Great. 
Um, well, I'm just, honestly, I'm just glad that this is happening and that uh, you guys are working so hard to, um, to pull it all together and, and try to centralize it. I think it's, it's a good move. Uh, Dan, you have a question or comment? Yeah, uh, Klaus, thanks for going through all of this. Um, uh, so on, um, on the cybersecurity, the way the numbers look, it looks as if that's a new thing this year. Is that really a new thing with a new contract or is that also coming from someone else's budget? Um, not objecting to doing cybersecurity seems really important. Just interested in kind of how we got to there and, and, and you know, if that is a big increase or it's really just a continuation of what's already been happening. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And certainly um, that's a good one over beers for sure. But, um, you know, the when prior to the malware attack that occurred in 2019, the, the relative uh, spend for the town in cybersecurity was um, was very minimal, um, kind of non -tra traceable because it was buried into a lot of other areas. Um, uh, of course, at that point in time, uh, with the bringing in consultants, uh, we entered into sort of a year to year contract with a group that was extraordinarily expensive. Um, and again, everything was done at that point in time in a, in a very reactive mechanism. So there wasn't time for evaluation. Um, since then, we've had an opportunity to sort of evaluate a number of different vendors. We have since chosen a different vendor who we went with over the past two years. Um, and that cost on the line item covers what we have entered into an agreement with them. Um, we've been very happy with their responsiveness. It, it covers a, quite an array of software packages as well as um, uh, 24 by 7, 365 monitoring um, and, and reaction uh, if anything is detected. Um, so I think that actually reflects a, a savings comparatively to what we had been spending over the past two years. Um, but again, I'm not uh, entirely sure what line item the, that spend had come into. I think it might have been done at a capital level, but uh, Deb, you might not might know more than I would on this in terms of how that was paid for previously. Yeah, I, th I think it was kind of buried in that network support line. If you look up there, it's uh, 5306. Can you uh, see you're me right. How, okay. You know, like the 29,000, yeah. 32,000. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Great, thanks. That's that's super helpful. Just what I was after. Any um, thought been given to looking to see whether uh, there could be some savings if um, the town were to have its data in the in a cloud uh, situation somewhere? Uh, there, to be honest, um, yes. Um, and as a matter of fact, the vast majority of the town's data actually already is in the cloud. Um, so we, um, uh, most of the services, the communication-based services that the town uses, particularly email, um, is already a hosted system. We, there's no equipment or services uh, that are all like on-premises, they call it, um, anymore. That's all done through essentially Office 365. Um, we, the amount of storage that the, the total departments have um, is actually very, very small. Um, we do have a cloud-based service that we utilize for the backups of services and some critical systems. Um, that again is also cloud-based. So um, we do have some cloud-based utilities that we have already engaged and have been doing so in the last couple of years. Um, I think there's opportunity for more uh, and that certainly may um, help mitigate some risk, I think from you know, some of the equipment expenses. But at the same point in time, we, we'd certainly have to evaluate it because it would likely mean that the licensing costs would go up. So the relatively high cybersecurity charge, then if, if, it, if the data is mostly in the cloud, what is that protecting? Ah, uh, the, yeah. The, so the, the cybersecurity is, um, is sort of a multi-layered approach. Um, there's, so we have what's called a SOC, which is a security operations center that essentially um, is like our, um, is our protector, I guess, of the town's uh, assets from a IT and from a, a cybersecurity perspective. So um, we have an agreement with them. They have uh, a, a monitoring device that's on each of the individual uh, municipal building networks um, that are monitoring the physical network for all of the data flow. 
um, to look to see if there's anything out of the ordinary. That's that's happening as we speak. You know, obviously it's monitoring all the Zoom communications. Um, we also have an individual. Uh, there's two separate individual software packages that are placed on all of the the towns uh, PCs, laptops um, that physically prevent uh, malware and antivirus. And that also is connected to that um, security operations center and, and is monitoring and reporting to them. So it's really the, the charge is essentially for the licensing and the use of those security packages. It's also for the 24 by 7, 365 monitoring, as well as the support and alerting process for that. So if anything is detected either by the software or by their monitoring, um, then a number of us in town are notified. Um, we can make some decisions whether or not we can isolate that individual device from the network or shut it off, um, or if there are any uh, additional steps that we need to take based upon the threat. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments about the uh, newly created IT department budget? Well, what's the network support? Uh, so the network support is um, support of our physical network equipment and communications. Um, so we, uh, we're working to put in place a essentially a, a data flow management monitoring system uh, that look at all of the different um, switches and routers in the town um, and help us manage that from a remote perspective. And so the network support is not only some of the software packages licensing, um, but also the service fees that are encountered as part of that. It does not include the security, network security, right? That's correct. It's not specifically for, uh, there are some elements in there that are sort of I, network security based, but it's not specifically security, like the same way the cybersecurity line item is. But anything security related is now in the cybersecurity. That that's really what we're going to be trying to do is to 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 roll it up into that category. Yes, I believe I heard you say on equipment, but uh, oh, I'm I'm sorry, sir. You you cut out there for a second. I don't know if it was on my end. Could, would you no, mind it's repeat? it's my end. Unfortunately, new laptop. The microphone is not working with the new laptop. So. Uh, the I, I I heard you. Can can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So please. Yeah. Okay. I heard you. I believe say something about SOC and and maybe monitoring on the individual machines, but not necessarily anything about network security. When you talked about, security, but there is something there. Yeah. There's actually so um, along with as part of that contract. Um, that organization that we're working with, um, we have a physical device that is uh, installed at each of the different networks across the town department. So essentially at each of the individual buildings. Um, and so that device is, is monitoring the traffic flow uh, and patterns across the network, and it's reporting back into that centralized um, management system. And that's again provided as part of that contract. So I'd echo what uh, Steve said earlier. Um, I, I would have a more realistic number uh, under You're breaking up that, Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me okay now? Is it better now? Yeah, go ahead. I would agree with Steve. I would have liked to see a more realistic number that is sustainable on on the top line number there. And uh, uh, I would say a comment on the equipment purchasing though. I would I would rather my recommendation would be to keep to to make that standardized by the IT department, but the expenses don't necessarily to be under the IT department. They can be under the individual departments. Yeah, so for actually, example, purchasing laptops, we can standardize that process under an IT department, but the expenses don't need to be under the IT department. They can be under the individual departments to reflect the spend by the individual departments. 
Yes, absolutely. And um, that's actually something that we're, we've just started putting into place this past year. And again, it's, it's an ongoing effort. Um, so we're working specifically with CDWG, who um, is obviously a large organization and they specialize in, in services and providing equipment for um, government and municipality based organizations. Um, we're, we're trying to utilize them as the sort of standardized approach for purchasing of you know, IT based equipment um, and, you know, having an individual sort of like login and account for each of the different departments. So it all rolls up under a standard process. But like you said, that it still ends up being um, being budgeted or uh, being managed, I guess, at a, at a departmental level. The, the one additional piece just to add to that is that um, because we with our our ability to use CDWG, um, that is uh, there. That organization is also working at the state level. So when we do a lot of our purchasing, uh, more recently we've been able to transition um, and utilize the state contract or state bid cost model um, for the purchasing of that equipment, which of course is sort of an incumbent savings. Great. Any other questions or comments about IT? Well, the, the only thing I would say is I'm still having a hard time understanding how this only reflects a one and a half to two percent increase overall from from the other numbers we're seeing. I mean, I think Deb, you said about thirty seven thousand was taken other out of other departments. Yes, that's correct. And then, and I'm not seeing. I'm just looking at the board, the select board budget that we just looked at tonight and I'm I, I'm not seeing a large decrease for IT. Yeah, it could be, uh, I took, there was a line item. The only thing we had in uh, select board was $35,000 budgeted in FY22. And I took that line item out of the select board's budget and put it into this new department. So you see the FY22 budget of $35,000 that was one line item in FY22 at the select board's budget. And so it was, it's completely removed as is the previous year expenses. So that you would be, when you looked at the select board budget, you would be comparing apples to apples. I can send you a, um, I think I'm, I think initially I had it like below the line, but it was a lot of numbers. So I think I removed it for your purposes, but I can send it back to you with the, the line items below the line. So you can see what was included in there in years past. Because like in FY21, there was that $74,000 uh, that you see in the FY21 actual in this budget right now. Yeah. In FY21, that was showed up as one line item on the selectman's budget, but it's not there anymore because it's here, if that makes any sense. And then in addition to that, about 30 X thousand dollars worth of stuff has been pulled out of various other departments. Is that right? Uh, for FY23, yes. For FY23, yes. 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 Yeah. So that's 45 and 37, right? So that's that's still not 108. Or am I missing wait, something? I, yeah, I think, wait, what, what were those numbers that you just said, Jane? Well, I thought you said Deb, 35 came out of the select board. For FY22 yeah. budget. Yeah, so, yeah. so Jane, essentially in, so in FY21, the select board had a $74,224 IT line. In FY22, for some reason, that number was only 35,000. But uh, presumably, the actual spend um, possibly distributed amongst various uh, various lines was, was probably still closer to 74, would be my guess. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if you remember what happened was in FY19, it was the IT charges were in the board of selectmen. And then in FY20, the directive was to move it to selectmen. 
and uh, there was no budget. Yeah, so, I do remember that there was a year yeah. that there was no, there was a zero. There was a zero. So then, uh, so then the following year, when you're creating the budget for the following year, I think that they budgeted low because all of a sudden it was going from zero to 35 mm -hmm. rather than from zero to 75, if that makes any sense. Because the FY22 budget, obviously, of $35,000 wasn't very realistic. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out or trying to better understand is that if if money has, I'm, I'm sure you're correct that um, the overall spend has been you know, pretty consistent and this is not a huge leap forward. But what I'm trying to better understand is that I don't see a way to figure out how this spend, if only 37,000 has been pulled out of other departments, it seems to me that there's a balance there that's still in those other departments. Maybe I'm thinking about that in the wrong way, but you know, if, if, if the spend is the same, but only 37,000 has been pulled out of the other departments. But 37,000 out of um, the other departments that are not where the IT expense wasn't incurred. So 75,000, well, basically was pulled out of the selectman's budget, plus the 37,000 out of fire, town building, police, and library. Is That's where the 37,000 comes from, plus the 75,000 out of the board of selectmen for, but the 75,000 that came from the Board of Selectmen didn't come out of last year's Board of Selectmen. It came, it, 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 a few years ago, it was 75, and then it seems to have trickled out into other departments. But now only 37 is further trickling out of those other departments to the current, you see what I'm saying? I don't, Jane, I don't think that, um, I don't think that any money actually from from FY twenty one to twenty two, when the select board's IT line went from seventy four thousand to thirty five thousand, the the balance there didn't actually trickle out to other departments. It simply wasn't budgeted for. It got covered at the end of the year in end of year transfers. That was a mistake. Okay. It shouldn't have been. It shouldn't have been set at thirty five thousand dollars. It should have been set higher. It should have been set at seventy five thousand dollars last year, or I guess for for FY twenty two. Okay. So, so this really isn't trackable because it's it just somehow got covered somewhere by someone. <laughs> yeah, I think essentially because there was a year, essentially uh, there was one year where somebody decided to move all of IT from one department into another department. Um, so then that got zeroed out, um, but then uh, the other department didn't actually put put the IT number in there. So that was still also zero. So essentially, the, the town budgeted zero for IT for a year, uh, but at, but luckily I think there was enough end of year turnbacks to cover that difference. Um, if, if it helps, I can put together a, a, a spreadsheet tomorrow that outlines where all the uh, the department, all the line items of the other departments that the money's coming out of. I mean, I, I have it in various places and I can just summarize it and send it to you if that would make it, so, it simplify things it would help to, i mean I, you know i hate to make extra work for you but i mean my, my preference jane my preference would be to have to have deb focus on updating the budget model well yes i don't think i don't think deb doesn't have enough time to do both of her jobs so honestly i would prefer that she work on the finance director job and not the accountant job at this moment <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> I agree with that. I, I, the budget model yeah. is important. Yeah. So if uh, if 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 sorting out the nuts and bolts of the IT budget means that the budget model gets delayed by a day, I would rather that you, I would rather that you work on the budget model. <laughs> All righty, you got it. I'm sorry to steamroll you on that one, Jane, but I'm pretty sure that no, you I also would rather. Agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. Yes. Um. Okay. Any other questions about IT? Okay. I 
I, I, I hope that in a couple of years, this whole IT budget will make a lot more sense and it'll be stable and there'll be a, a clear person in charge of the department. All right. Um, and I believe now at long last, Dorothea, thank you for being so patient, but we have the sustainability budgets. Let me get this on screen. I saw it tagged on to the, um, yeah, here it is. Um, all right, so I think this, this part is pretty straightforward, right? Because it's just essentially your salary and and correct me if I'm wrong, this is just your portion of sustainability, right? Uh, Gino's portion is in the planning board budget. Is that right? Um, that's my impression, but I'd like to, to maybe check with Deb if that's something that we have to, um, I think, you know, Gino's salary is, was at least in the past kind of tucked into uh, one budget, but my impression now that this is like um, the 38,000 is what I, and um, it's basically Gino and I together. Oh, I see. Is that, Deb, is that right? Well, it, it's actually, yeah, it's very confusing. You know, in FY21 was the year that we got the the grant for $38,000. Yeah. And in, and in that year, that covered both Dorothea and Gino. And um, I mean, that's what it, it was intended to do, but it, it definitely covered Dorothea. And then there was an additional $28,000 that got spread between a couple different places. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 23,000 of it went to, uh, to town buildings, 4,000 of it went to, um, of Gino's pay went to the grant and then a thousand of it went to the planning board budget. So now for FY22, mm -hmm. the whole $38,000 is Dorothea. Okay. And uh, Gino is getting paid, but it is being charged to the planning board budget. But there was no okay. budget for Gino's salary um, at the time. David just said we'll cover it out of the out of town building somewhere, whatever it goes over. So mm -hmm. it really wasn't budgeted. So we're going to okay. have to see how that pans out at the end of the year here. I see. So, but for FY twenty three. This truly reflects Dorothea's budget. This is just all Dorothea. And okay. Gino added his portion of sustainability to the planning board budget. Okay. All right, so then let me just, oops, whoa, that's too big. Okay, so then, so you are 18 hours, and then how many hours is Gino? Uh, Gino, I believe is 18 hours as well. Our third, no, I'm okay. sorry, he's 13, 13 hours. Okay. Yeah, so I think 13 hours of sustainability related work. Right. So uh, that would be the green communities application, the grants application and everything that's associated with like, uh, executing on the grants, like, you know, doing the actual uh, improvements on the town buildings. Okay. So that this now this actually may be more of a question for Michael Lesser, who's also on here, because I think the energy committee sort of was the push behind the creation of the sustainability coordinator, right? And so what was there a number of hours per week of sustainability coordinator that was uh, in your proposal, or was that sort of left up to the town? Hi, um, that was left up to the town. David has been has primarily taken care of all the budgeting, and okay. we haven't really seen that part. But uh, um, but they basically we sort of all work a little bit as a team. I mean, Gino has been doing a little more focus on the municipal operations, and Dorothea 
on uh, residents and town-wide issues um, there. Um, but yeah, no, I, we haven't, as the committee hasn't been part of the budgeting issue um, from the beginning, maybe that will change, but David was taking care of that kind of allocations and things. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I just, I think I've, I never really fully understood the, the time split between you and, and Gino and, um, you know, just sort of looking at the hours here, at, uh, I just wanted to know what the process was whereby we, we arrived at this particular s split of the duties and the hours and the pay. Mm -hmm. um, and then I believe this, Uh, was there a, I'm just, oh, you, I you question. sent me, yeah, go Sophia, ahead. Sophia, are you writing grants like Gino and getting money that way? Uh, yes, I do, Natalie. Um, oh. um, I'm basically in charge of engagement and outreach. So I'm, I'm looking for private foundations um, that are doing that kind of thing. And I've written two grants in the order of $3,000 for um, school projects that are associated with curriculum, sustainability curriculum integration, and with projects that, you know, are connecting okay. the school so you, community. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you wrote two grants for $3,000. Did you right. get them? Did you get them? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you've gotten three thousand dollars in grants, right? A total of six thousand two hundred. Oh, six. Okay, six thousand two hundred in grants. Michael, when you proposed this um, position to town meeting, I was there. And was it not said that that position was going to pay for themselves? I was not. I was not part of the original warrant article that went into this. Um, so the uh, the grants, um, so therefore, besides these two grants there, there are other grants that there's some technical assistance as a re there's a there's also a, re a residential uh, regional residential technical assistant grant of about twenty five thousand dollars with MAPC that we were also well, wait, 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 that we got we got a twenty five thousand dollar grant is that what you just no, said not to us no it's twenty five thousand dollars that goes to, doesn't come to the town, it goes to a uh, to paying for some services that are going to help the town do more outreach and help residents basically do more energy efficient and um, and more greener in interventions in their homes in terms of let's say solar. Mm -hmm. and heat so we're going to get you're going to get a twenty five thousand that you applied no. for twenty five thousand dollar plan. I missed something there. No, no, it's it's basically I would say co funding from the state, I guess, from MAPC that's contributing. We're not getting the money. It's part of a, uh, a regional grant that's being supported by six towns, but we're not getting the money. We're getting services, basically okay. getting help in doing that, in doing that activity. Um, in essence, we've probably, the money for um, doing outreach and working with residents is, uh, oh yeah, that's from the annual report. Um, that there's uh, is less sources of funds for some of that than versus for some, doing some of the town operations where basically we did the street lights and other kind of things that we just did um, as well as- so some wait, you, you go. Put in, wait a minute, I'm, I'm confused. Did you put in street lights? Uh, yeah, the street lights were all replaced in, uh, in the end of December. You're now looking when you're driving around, yeah. you're all seeing uh, LED street lights that are better quality and they basically have significant savings in the uh, in the electricity bills for the town now. Um, so there's, we haven't seen the actual bills yet to, to actually do the numbers. It was estimated that it would be about 8,000 bucks a year. Um, yeah. And I think it might be a little bit more depending on how we control the lights and things like that. But we'll come back and figure that out soon when we get the bills. Um, so that's been done, and there's going to be some projects on uh, on doing some weatherization at Town Hall and DPW that'll save some money there on the town side. 
And but that's all been, that's, that work's all been done to get that. But that, that money's coming in and the work's been done to get that money, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and we basically look for new grants. We'll do more community, green community grants uh, for the next year once we finish these here. And, uh, and we're looking and part of the whole issue now is the thrust of whether how we all comply in the town. And you'll see when you guys come to the... Uh, to the student initiated warrant article on a, uh, a climate and ecological emergency. They'll see how the town goes, whether the town has to do some more. There's a request there for the town to do work as, as a whole, that not just a municipal operation should be getting towards net zero in its energy use, but whether all of the residents will start working towards that goal, which is what we've been doing a lot of in the last year. It's one of these things that sort of has to build slowly. We have the town website on sustainable Sherborne. There's gonna be outreach, there's outreach at the high school, at the schools and working with the kids. But even in, the, in that initiative, that's, I mean, you could scroll up, there's a bunch of sort of more residential uh, work with people and co energy coaches that were trained to sort of work with individual residents there's a newsletter that Dorothea does that goes out, I think, to about three or 400 households at this 500 time. 500 by now. 500 <laughs> now. Um, and, and it's hard to tally up how much people are actually doing at the residential level. And we're trying to encourage the electric vehicle with the charging stations at Town Hall. Um, and uh, we just got a grant that that basically pays for putting in one of the more, the level three high charging things where you basically can get your car charged in 15 or 20 minutes um, there. That should go in in the next year. And that was just awarded last week. Um, but the, uh, but essentially uh, the issue is how the town's gonna make its effort to join the state's climate policy act um, where there's targets or mandated reductions of total of total greenhouse gas emission reductions by 2030 or even by 2025, there's all these targets and how we do our part um, to do that is, uh, is, a, is, is a lot of what Dorothea's work is and, uh, and trying to find that out and fi find out what things do work. Um, it's gonna be a real, it's a real challenge and it'll be interesting to see the discussion at town meeting around the article to see whether uh, people vote to support that kind of article and, and and reinforce our ideas that we've got to go do something now. But I'll stop there. Uh, Jane, you have your hand up. Sorry, we're getting it off mute. Um, yeah, I, I have a, a couple of questions. One is that I believe this position was originally approved at around the thirty-eight thousand dollar level, and um, and then Gino, you know, some extra hours came in for Gino. We we seem to have gone from the original thirty-eight thousand to over sixty-eight thousand total when you tally up the amount that's in the planning board budget for Gino's hours on sustainability and the amount that's in this budget. So how did how did we get there? I guess is my question. How how did we get from thirty-eight to sixty-eight? Um, I don't think Gino's budget is that much. He's at the 12 or 13 hours. Um, well, the planning board put in $29,166 for sustainability. So is that, I assume that's Gino. Am uh, I yeah, I think that's, that? That, that is Gino. I just bad. Is that th is that twelve or thirteen hours times his his salary? I believe it is. Okay, seems uh, higher than. Um, I uh, that was beyond. I can't answer to that because that was something that David Williams was working on, and uh, at times I was I asked about how all of the budget was going, but that was even handled last year by him. And the Energy and Sustainability Committee was not part of that process of how he managed the budgets there and how it went through last year. So I can't, 
I can't answer to that. I find the Geno's amount a little high, but I guess, um, but obviously it's still more. Um, but I would say that in terms of the total grants, if you look at us as a team and the way we view ourselves, that there's been sort of funding of easily $100,000 or more between some of the various grants and technical assistance, if you just look at it as an aggregate. Um, so that in some sense, there's been, uh, there's been work done and money coming in that has, uh, has been on a reasonable par with that. And yeah, so do you know what do you know was doing that before? Wasn't he always writing grants? Uh, he was writing some. It wasn't regularly. It was an intermittent process over the years. We became a green community some years ago, but and we did ten years already. And uh, grants for that were written were written in intermittent years. Now it's a more regular process that we look for and go for things. I mean, we've written grants for a lot more than than this. I mean, there was a grant, I think, I think guess it was the year before, maybe and it overlapped into this last year of, uh, we were looking for uh, well over $100,000. That was very competitive, we thought we would be getting and that didn't come through. Um, so it's been a more competitive uh, atmosphere for, uh, for writing grants. But I think that, so now it's a more regular process. It's a regular activity of trying to seek out where there's funding sources. Um, on an ongoing, I mean, we talk about it at our meetings uh, that we, and we meet several times a month. So it's a matter of what's out there to do. Um, and right, it's, I would say that this activity of dealing, addressing sustainability in the town is gonna go beyond one of, mm -hmm. I guess I'll change the framework from Yes, it could possibly pay for itself with some of the grants and some of the things there, but it's going to become a, it's a task to meet our greenhouse gas reductions that all towns are having to face. And many towns are getting sustainability coordinators, but it's a task when you move into the residential area of trying to get our residents to line up um, with the kind of targets that we need to meet, that that's not going to be something that's going to be funded ongoing that it's gonna be a task that we're gonna to have to share in ourselves out of our town budget to try to make a difference. And I think we'll have to make a difference in the sense that I think that the benefits of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions um, in terms of the avoided cost in the future and all the impacts that we're seeing from climate change, that those benefits will easily exceed the cost of these sustainability coordinator uh, amounts. And that I think that I would advocate that it's the way I, I suggest that we think about it going forward is that it's a task to, that reducing our emissions is, is a townwide task that we have to do and we're gonna have to do some funding to it. It's not something that will happen without the support of some people here. As volunteers in the committee, we do some tasks, but it's a lot of work uh, to move on this. So I would try to move the thinking of what, of what these positions mean and what the importance is for the town and our, and our commitment to doing it just as, and it's the same discussion I'll say with the warrant article that's gonna come up eventually uh, before you. I mean, we've had the students present to us. We'll send you a letter. We sent a letter of support for the article to the select board, which we'll pass on to you after to see whether there's any changes we wanna make after the select board have a hearing on it on Saturday, I think at one o'clock. But I think out of that, to the extent that that kind of um, article and what it means about for the town goes forward, we're gonna need this kind of resources to keep to do this and the kind of work that Dorothy is doing and to build on the activities that are in the annual report. Um, so I'll stop there for the moment. I don't know if Dorothy wants to say something or others want to. Um, that's very well put, uh, Michael, it's a gargantuan task. Um, and I repeat this again, um, I have already, you know, mentioned it to the select board. Our greenhouse gas inventory is done since, you know, uh, the summer of um, 2020. 
And the result is that basically 86% um, of all emissions in our town are coming from homes. Um, almost equally split between transportation, individual transportation, and of course, heating and cooling our homes. And the solutions are out there and the people, and I'm noticing a pickup um, in kind of awareness in town that there are solutions like air source and ground source heat pumps. And we've done a couple of um, EV shows in town. And uh, people are reaching out to me to, to know more and to get to know how they can transform their home into a better performing home by uh, uh, saving energy, saving on bills and uh, increasing comfort. And that's something that we have to consistently bring to our residents. Um, I've done it myself. I have transformed the fixer upper um, into um, a well-performing home with solar panels, electric uh, cars, high efficiency gas. And I might switch to an air source heat pump uh, once uh, the occasion presents itself in a couple of years. And um, we know, and I know that we have some serious uh, people in our community that are very serious about this and have already done full electric homes that don't use any, any fossil fuels. And um, my outreach um, showcases these people that have done uh, are early adopters of these technologies. And um, this town lives on you, you Hubert, how do you get that word out? How do you showcase them, Dorothea? Um, Natalie, we have a newsletter um, and we have showcased um, three residents that have done um, amazing work um, in doing a combination of solar and air source heat pumps or um, you know, wood pellets. And I would be happy to put you on the distribution list so you see what comes out every two weeks. Or all of you on it, I guess, maybe not all of the advisory is, but um, maybe. <laughs> um. So I've shared uh, our year's re annual report with um, Stephen and um, you should have it hopefully soon. And it, it is, I wanna say, I think it's getting noticed um, and uh, we will move on and uh, transform we have young, a lot of younger families moved to town in recent years um, due to the pandemic. And I know from my own experience working in sustainability for almost 10 years that the generation millennials are the ones that you know, have a higher awareness of, of the issues and want to execute on that. So I have hopes we can uh, work with the elementary school, Pine Hill community that I find is very forward thinking. And I'll leave it by that. If, if people want to connect with me uh, from the advisory board on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I would be grateful because I don't know anybody yet and I, I would love to involve you as well in this kind of outreach and uh, hear back from you what you think um, a valuable sustainability outreach or engagement strategy could be for this town. So that would be something I would look forward to. Thank you, Dorothea. I, you know, ultimately, I think it's the, um, the, the challenging thing is that you're, you have a unique role in the town, right? Because most of the town employees have, um, you know, a defined role. They have, Wait, we're not hearing you. Yeah, I got to switch over here. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, yeah, so ultimately you have a unique role, right? Because uh, most of the other town employees, they have a very defined role and they have job tasks that they have to perform and they get paid for, for, for doing these, these jobs, right? But, but your, I think that your role is a little bit more um, nebulous and it's a little bit hard to um, quantify and track. 
certainly I think that obviously the grants that come in are easy to quantify and track and and we being the financial committee are going to be um, very much focused on that aspect of your Mm -hmm. sort of collective role between you and Gino Um, and and because of the fact that the way that this position was pitched um, to the town was essentially that it was going to pay for itself many times over quite easily. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, I can say that uh, I think that some advisory members were probably skeptical of that claim, um, but, you know, still we, we see the value in the sustainability coordinator Um uh, and obviously, it was the the town's collective decision um, to um, to create this position. But still, we're in the early phases, and we need to try to kind of like keep an eye on what 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 it is that you're doing, what it, it is mm-hmm. that you're bringing to the town, and um, you know, essentially, what sorts of activities. Um, you are actually doing. And I think that this annual report is important. Um, and I think that an accounting of all of the grants that have been brought in and or savings that have been realized, you know, in terms of reduced um, energy costs and whatnot, I think that that is all important information that we on the advisory committee are going to be most focused on. Um, and I think that as time goes on, uh, most likely the advisory committee will just want to see that uh, a, a continued level of sort of um, uh, grant awards to the town that that at least continues to um, pay for the cost of your department, um, ideally more than that. And then on top of that, to see what other sort of the community outreach that you do. And ideally, if there were some way to quantify the effect that that outreach is having, you know, I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't know what that would look like, but that's essentially, that's what we're going to want to see. You know, Uh, I Mm -hmm. I think that it's good that in, in, in this past year that, you know, I I think that it does, it looks like you've, you and Gino have, um, have brought in over a hundred thousand dollars and your salaries are collectively, um, about $70,000, you know, but, you know, it's, it's a hard task to continue, continue paying for yourself with grant monies. And I, and I know that Michael indicated that, uh, as, as this goes on, we'll probably be seeing diminishing returns to the point where, where you, you may not actually be paying your own salary, but that the work that you're doing, um, has a broader effect that is sort of important on a global scale, um, which is all well and good. But in the first couple of years, we're going to want to see that the money coming in is greater than the money going out, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, we make sense what you said there. And we're going to work on, I mean, it's an important activity for us on the, let's say, on the committee to see how we, what the benefits are in terms of moving towards the global climate, the uh, climate change issues and what kind of greenhouse gas reductions and how you translate that into some sort of, there's ways of monetizing that to say what the avoided costs are of the system people. There's lots, lots of work done on that kind of way of doing it, but just even meeting the goals of reductions. And that's part of what we have to figure out is how to, how to get, how to have a sense of what people are doing out there in terms of what the adoptions are of of greenhouse gas reductions at the household level. And that's part of right. We see that as our task uh, to try to figure that out and to somehow get the get adoption being done faster um, and to try to accelerate it from what would happen if we weren't doing anything. Um, so we see that as our part of our job, whether we do another solar homes pro, uh, program or we're thinking of maybe doing a little heat pumps for hot water heaters in town, which will save stuff. And then to be able to quantify those things is something that's on our, we see as on our plate to do for you and for the town. Thanks. Uh, Anybody else from advisory have any questions or comments? Um, Great. Um, all right. Well, I believe that that is the last budget. Mm. Can I ask a question of when you're, or the, 
is it in March 2nd when you're going to see the warrant articles? I'm curious when you might see the climate emergency warrant. Yeah, I still need to schedule those. That's that's me being a procrastinator. Um, but I believe I, I think that there are two there are two weeks that we've got set aside for for that. It, uh, it, it is the first and second week of, uh, of March. Um, so if right. that's March, if that's the second and the, and the ninth, then, then it would be that. Um, so I don't know which day yet. OK, I'll say it's a little funny, even though for adults, you know, we have to all sit around and wait in line. But uh, but it's interesting for the students since they have their school stuff There's about Five, there's anywhere from uh, at least maybe five students who might present to uh, help them figure out what works for them. You might reach, I could help you reach out to them if it, or Dorothea can actually, okay. uh, just to make it a little easier for their scheduling. Um, somehow we will give a little deference to students and their work time if you, if, uh, if you can. Sure. Um, you know they don't have very long to speak, right? If you have five students, isn't the max three minutes? Oh no, they have a they have a round robin thing where they have a they have a nice PowerPoint presentation that they walk through and uh, each one of them takes a few of them. So okay. they they've been they've been working on it. We've been giving some advice, and, uh, but it's really their project. We don't want to get too uh, over uh, overdoing it there. But uh, so but yes, they're well aware of that and they're working on that. Since we're all still here, can I so can I just double check? Go back to something that I believe Jane brought up. So it is. Is the total cost on the salary side of the grant writing the sixty-eight thousand dollars? Is that what we the conclusion came to? The twenty-nine from Gino and the thirty-eight or so for Dorothea's position? Yes, I believe that's correct. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, and that from 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 what I'm gathering uh, right now that uh, that was simply done by the town administrator. Because I don't, I don't believe we specified precisely how that was going to work. I think we we just we we approved the position at the town meeting, and then from there on, I think um, because the town administrator is also the HR director, I think uh, I think uh, he he decided that more hours were necessary, and uh, and he just did it. Yeah, and I, I I think that that's why in fiscal year 21, um, the money paid to Gino was kind of split in a number of different places. And there was truly no budget for his hours in FY22. So FY23, you're seeing the correction of all that um, behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, and, you know, ultimately, uh, like you know i'm a i'm a tree hugger right i've got i got solar panels i've got my hybrid subaru i got my geothermal uh and uh i am all for all for sustainability but as the as the chair of the advisory committee i also need to make sure that uh that we're tracking and quantifying and that we are getting our money's worth you know <laughs> so those 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 two things do not do not have to be in conflict right agreed um great um well it's very late um so i would propose that we move on and i was going to say let's punt on the minutes but next week is going to be the schools and then after that we have a week off and then we're going to be into the warrant articles that we have just nothing but long meetings coming up so so i propose that we just try to knock out these minutes tonight Please. all right um thank you Yep, thank you guys. Thank you. All right, so these are the minutes uh, by, was it Jane? Thank you, Jane. Jane did misspell my name. The V. It's all right, because Leahy Le and I, we, we're opposite team Stevens, so. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> there can be only uh, one winner at the end of the day. So. <laughs> um, all right. So 
I apologize. This is my first time actually reading these minutes because uh, that's just how I work these days. Uh, but if anybody has any corrections that they already know of, uh, feel free to, to call them out while I'm reading through these. Oh, look, here's the, here's the number for Gino, 29166. Actually, though, Steve, based on what we just heard, I guess those hours were not previously covered in the select board budget. Well, they were... I they were For FY21 actuals they were they were never in the budget but in the actual expenditure they were that was just an unbudgeted position that's correct i wonder how, do we have any more of those hanging around you know uh no, I don't believe so. I think that this was kind of a result of the first year it being a sustainable uh, a grant. And then uh, I think it kind of morphed from the grant into a into a line item on the selectman's budget. And then, yeah, I'm not quite sure what David's thought process was there. Um, I think technically, and I won't get into it, uh, but just technically the um, the conservation agent is also an, an, an unbudgeted expansion of the position in the current year. And I believe he did that with a previous, uh, there's, there was definitely, there was definitely another position where he did, he did something similar where middle of the fiscal year, he approved uh, an expansion of a position um, that was unbudgeted. And then we had to basically approve it in the next year's budget. It is a, a, a stratagem that I hope the next town administrator does not employ liberally. Uh, possibly if we have a separate person doing human resources that might, you know, put a, put a kibosh on that. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> Probably also one of the reasons why I want the personnel board to get more involved in, in these sorts of matters. Well, we don't have to approve them the next year. <laughs> That's true. I know, but it's just, then we become the people who have to fire somebody who's already been hired. <laughs> What did you say, Jane? I couldn't hear you. I said we don't have to approve them the next year. Uh, was this the correct amount for the uh, ARPA request, 42,350? Well, that was on the sheet, but I, you know, I, we should check it. It was 40, it's 44,000. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, other than that, I have no uh, edits. Anybody else have any corrections? All right, can I, um get a motion to approve the minutes of the february 2nd uh advisory committee uh meeting as edited on screen mm -hmm. uh, can i get a second was there a second all right uh, let's vote uh dan aye mark let's skip over mark for now wasim Everyone's falling asleep. Everybody's nodding off. Yeah, I know. Jane. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't mean no. I meant I, but I, <laughs> I have uh, 
my microphone, my usual headset is not working. Anyway, hi. Uh, hi. Okay. Uh, Brendan. Hi. Steve. Hi. Natalie. Hi. And I'm also an I. Uh, we'll take Mark as an abstain. All right. Can I get um, a? And so the uh, minutes are approved. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I I just looked at the ARPA request and it is actually forty two three fifty. I think. Uh, Why well, I was kind of a little late to <laughs> go off mute. The. So in the in the request that was sent to us in email, I for, I forgot what was presented on the sheet on the actual, but in the in the email, um, I think it's the total is forty two three fifty. At least okay. that's the uh, that's what we got from WRS. What is that? That's the uh, Water Resource Services. Oh, uh, that that may have been the uh, that may have been the uh, the proposal the the estimate. But on the actual ARPA request form that was, you know, filled out by Jeannie Guthrie, it's a, it's forty four thousand. I can here. I can bring. Um, oh, no, no worries. No, no need to delay. Just wanted to. Okay. And in, uh, I think in in the in the numbers that Deb pulled together that you saw on that table for uh, ARPA funding to date, it was forty four. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... here's the got it. Okay. Here's here's the actual form, the actual request. So the actual request is for forty four thousand. Yeah. And just just to FYI, um, Diane, you know, asked Jeannie if we can just hold off on this until the whole ARPA process kind of settles down a little bit. So this isn't going forward to the uh, board of selectmen, you know, for a little while just yet. Okay. Um, all right, I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All right, we're going to vote on that now. Dan, it's an I. Mark, it's asleep. Wasim, hey, Jane, hey, Brendan, hey, Steve, hi, Natalie, hi. All right, ten fifty-seven. We are adjourned. Thank you all for bearing with it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.